Hi, this is Joe Tate, and you're listening to The Sports Fix. Sports Fix listeners, do you tweet? So do we. So tweet with us 24-7 at The Sports Fix CLE. Business owners and professionals, do you want to take your business, your product, your team, your event to the next level? You want to advertise right here with the Sports Fix. Our listeners are among the most loyal listeners, terrestrial or internet. The Sports Fix universe is not only the radio show, but tens of thousands of fans on Facebook and Twitter. Email me, Jerry Myers, the Sports Fix at AOL.com. That's the Sports Fix at AOL.com. And let me help you swing for the fences and hit it out of the park right here on the Sports Fix. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Fantasy Jocks. Looking to upgrade your league trophy? Check out FantasyJocks.com for championship belts, rings, trophies, and more. Live in Ohio, it's time to get your fix. The Sports Fix. Welcome in. We're live. We're off and running on the air here. Tuesday edition of the Sports Fix. J-Rock with you getting it going. And we've got a loaded slate here today of guests coming up on the show, you guys. We've got a lot to talk about. The Cavaliers, man, are they humming? Are they humming in playoff mode or what? Even in chill mode. Even in it doesn't matter mode. I'll tell you what. They made a statement in the first quarter last night. And we're going to talk some Cavs here opening up the show early on. Still don't know who the Cavaliers are going to face in the first round of the playoffs. Man, there's still some some playoff running down going on here in the next couple of days. OKC and New Orleans have got themselves in a little situation over there almost every team has one game left to play there's a couple that have two games left to play we'll talk about all of that with the NBA heading into of course the final game of the regular season for the Cavs but man what a romp last night J.R. Smith shooting more through Cavaliers (laughs) over 800 threes this season I mean uh, before this season there had only been a handful of teams to do that and then six more teams did it this year the Cavaliers one of them uh, we'll talk about that, but even in chill mode, Cavaliers give you a little something to uh, get excited about last night. And there is, I'm going to say it again, this is the moments to relax and enjoy. I, so much, I'll, I'll get into my diatribe in a minute, saw stories about Kevin Love again this morning, and said, man, this is the time to relax and enjoy. Chill, for sure, man, and enjoy what's going on and what's about to go on. But we'll talk Cavs here in a minute. Uh, talking some Indians baseball. Tribe had a day off, and now they're getting back at it. Just a quick two-game set with the White Sox here. We get to see Carlos Carrasco and Trevor Bauer second time around. Jeff Gorman from Indians101.com. Jeff joins us here. First segment. Matter of fact, he'll be up just about 15 minutes from now. He'll join us. We'll talk Tribe. Look back at the first week for the Indians, and and good thing that you can look forward from that too because you can go nowhere but up we'll look ahead we'll talk a little bit of his thoughts on losing uh gomes and and all of that we'll talk indians baseball with my man jeff gorman from indians 101.com dr football bill check is back in the house after a several week absence good to hear that the doctor's feeling good he's coming back here we'll talk a little bit about the browns here they've got a uh, a, a big uh, fashion show tonight to get ready for. I was joking with some guys before the show, man. Like, look, I don't even watch the Victoria's Secret fashion show, so I'm definitely not going out of my way for that. Although, although I did see some uh, some supposed leaks this morning of the actual jerseys, not these fake ones that have been going around. And if what I saw this morning is legit, and it's been going around a lot of places, I'm digging it. I mean, it's cool. It's not as bad as it could be, although they continue to insist on bringing back that alternate orange jersey. I just don't like it. I just think they look like a big pumpkin, a big bowl of Kool-Aid, man. But uh, I don't like the orange jersey. But anyways, uh, the subtle changes to the Browns jer- the brown jersey with the orange stitching or whatnot, I, I kind of like that. It really, 
those throw me back to the to the late seventies, early eighties uniforms, and I'm okay with that. But I think we just spent as much time as you can spend talking about it, and yet somehow people have spent days and weeks. I realized yesterday when we went off the air, two hours and forty minutes, didn't mention it not one time during yesterday's broadcast. Didn't even say the word uniform. But uh, I'll be busy watching a baseball game. But there is a uniform special tonight, and then people can see what they've got going on. There'll be the official reveal of that. But we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk actual football with Dr. Football. We'll talk a little draft coming up here. We'll look on the offensive side of the ball. Of course, that's one of the things Dr. Football does. So we'll talk some draft. And, hey, how about the Steelers? Talk about uh, losing some talent quickly. Look at the offseason for the Steelers, their retirements. I mean, they lost Woods. They lost uh, 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 Palomalu, which we haven't even talked about here on the show. And now Cl- uh, Clark, or excuse me, um, um, Taylor. Ike Taylor, gone as well. Uh, that defensive backfield now taking a double whammy hit, and that's veteran. That's that's double-digit years in leadership. And, of course, you know, Palamalamu, as I used to call him, you know, jokingly, uh, he's the heart and soul of that thing there. We'll talk about all of that stuff with Dr. Football. Doug Plagans, the voice of the Legary Monsters, is here as the Monsters. We kind of talked about it a little bit yesterday. They've got a couple of days to get ready here, and then they've got a three-game playoff push coming up at the end of the week and into the weekend, and that's it. They're three games out, or excuse me, three points out of the final playoff spot in the AHL, and, uh, They've got three games. That means they've got six potential points on the board. Uh, they need to get three. Actually, they need four of them to, to overtake the eighth playoff spot. So we're going to talk to Doug Plagans about all of that. We'll set the stage for your tribe game tonight. We've got a lot to do. So how's the bouts? We get on doing it. Welcome in, you guys, to the Sports Fix. I am your host, the Big Daddy, here on this microphone. They call me the coordinator and conductor of the madness here. You can call me J-Rock, Jerry Myers. I'm here with you guys running the show each and every weekday, noon, live, right across the Sports Fix Radio Network. Maybe you're enjoying us on TuneIn, TuneIn's radio app worldwide, on Spreaker, on Mixler, in their respective digital and mobile apps. Maybe you're tuning in live on the sportsfix.net, our home base. It's the one-stop shop for everything you need. Make sure you bookmark it, by the way, the sportsfix.net. Or perhaps you are one one of the thousands and thousands around the world who enjoy the show 24 hours a day. Literally, I mean time zones all over on sites like iHeartRadio, the world's largest internet radio provider, on iTunes, on Stitcher Radio, on SoundCloud, on CarPlay, on all of the other uh, miscellaneous podcasts and featurette sites and all the different places that you guys find us, feed us, subscribe to us, do the thing and get your fix. Thank you guys so much for doing it and being a part of the show. Show, and this is the part where I always segue it into be the show because that's what you are. Pick up the phones, give us a call, hit your f- social media, hit your Facebook, hit your Twitter, flood the airwaves, baby, and be the voice of the sports fix. Phones are open 216 539 7535. 216 539 7535. Can't get to the phone? Maybe you're listening to us on your device. Then hit us up on Facebook and Twitter. Facebook.com slash the sports fix. Tweet with us at the sports fix CLE. Email us the sports fix at AOL.com. Facebook.com slash the sports fix. Tweet with us at the sports fix CLE. Email us the sports fix at AOL.com. And as we get rolling here, as I said, Jeff Gorman's going to join us about 10 minutes from now. We're going to talk a little. Indians baseball, but let's put that in chill mode for a minute and let's talk about the Cavaliers. Let's jump into last night. And you know what, Bruce, in the chat room there, that's the stat that I was referring to when I started the show. Cavaliers uh, became just the 11th team in NBA history with 800 three-point shots in a season. And uh, that sounded much more impressive until I read the second half of that stat, which was six of those happened this season. So... (laughs) More people did it this season, more teams did it this season than the rest of NBA history put together. So that kind of puts it in a little bit of perspective there about the, uh, the, the, you know, the three point shot in the current era that we live. And I'll tell you what, previously, none of the other five teams that had done that 
won the NBA championship, which, you know, perhaps at another time you would think is a bad sign for that style. But, I mean, as we've seen, I mean, say what you want, you know, about the, the shots and the type of – J.R. Smith, what do you go, 8 of eight of 13 last night from three? Uh, that's otherworldly stuff, and it happens every night. I mean, they, again, last night chucked up 32 three-pointers, but they made – 17 of them. They shot 53% from three last night. They they shot better from three than they did from the free throw line last night. They were all, And from two. They shot better from three than they did from the field or from the free throw line. I mean, I watch this team all the time and think they shoot too many threes. I, we talk about it here on the show. I always think that they're shooting too many threes, except when you roll down the stat sheet and you look at now, Kevin Love was one of six. He was really the only one that had a tough night last night shooting the three because everybody else was money. LeBron was three of four. Kyrie Irving made two of the three that he put up. Mentioned J.R. Smith with 8 of 13. James Jones was two for two. Shump had a three-pointer. So, I mean, across the board, the the shooting was was very well. Really, and think of the percentage if you take out Kevin Love's five missed shots there. It's a a much closer to 60% there for the rest of the team. So, I mean, you keep coming back to that, and any time you ask the question, do they shoot too many threes, then you come back to that. Look at the flip side. Look at Detroit last night, the Pistons, uh, with the exception of Karan Butler, who did very well for the Pistons last night. He went 6 of 9 for 3. Uh, look at the rest of the team. As a team, they went 9 for 25. But if you take off Karan Butler, I mean, they what did they go, 3 for three for 16, the rest of the team? Uh, even with Butler's 6 of 9, they only shot 36% from 3, 9 of 25. You go down their sheet, 0 for 5, 0 for 4, 0 for 1, and then a bunch of guys that just made 1 of 2. And, and But the, you you see, you think, man, this team is unreal with the with the ability to hit that. I mean, Stan Van Gundy said it after the game last night. He said uh, straight up, there's not a lot of holes on this team, no matter which way you try to play. It's going to take a great performance to beat the Cavs in a seven-game series, which is kind of what I've been saying all along. The Cavs can lose. They will lose a game here and there, but uh, as Van Gundy said, if you go big, they've got the guys that, to match you there. If you go small, they can match you there, and then, of course, you can really utilize LeBron defensively by moving him around wherever you need to if the other team goes small. Uh, and as he said, there's just not a lot of holes. And, I mean, we're seeing that here. And and I keep going back to this, to me, feels completely different. And I know it's easy in hindsight to say that, you know, because I remember back, you know, especially 2009. To me, that was the one, you know, the big one. But, uh, you know, of course we felt unstoppable heading into the playoffs then as well. But looking back now, you can see where the holes were. You know, here with this team, I'm telling you, uh, again. And you look at games that everybody was preparing for this week to be, eh, you know, whatever, Cavs in chill mode. They they are definitely uh, not stressed about the results of these, but they definitely wanted to prove a point in the first quarter. Look at how they came out and jumped off in that game last night. I mean, right off the bat, 36-14 first quarter, off and running, and there you go. And then even when they stopped playing defense in the second half and they started subbing everybody in, and and they still uh, ended up with a dominant victory last night, as they should. But, I mean, again, they stopped playing, and they were still uh, very dominantly and comfortably ahead. LeBron nailed the triple double I mentioned Smith he had 28 points last night and here you go now you're heading into the final game of the regular season you got fan appreciation night you'll probably see a similar substitution pattern I don't know you you may not even get 30 minutes out of LeBron like you did this time although it really depends on Kyrie I think he would have played uh, much closer to 25 26 minutes if Kyrie had been able to play in the second half and with him out We'll have to see uh, whether he, I I doubt he plays at all. Kyrie, I refer to, I doubt he plays at all in Wednesday's game because as uh, David Blatt said yesterday, they have been working with the hip here and this is the reason that he did not come back in. He played 17 first half minutes and was very effective. I mean, in his 17 minutes, Kyrie was uh, five of seven from the field, two of three from three point. I had a couple of rebounds, had a couple of assists. I mean, he was playing quite well, had 12 points, uh, but they kept him out for the second half. So, we'll see but I mean other than 
than that, you could probably expect similar minutes. And then you'll see your James Joneses and your Perkins and those guys get into double digit minutes. You'll see another 30 plus minute night probably out of Della Vadova and, and they'll finish things off. Still don't know exactly who they're going to play here as uh, there's still some stuff in play in the Eastern Conference. Looking at the state and the West too. The West is really coming down to a, it's a, they need help does Oklahoma City. But looking at the East first, because that applies to the Cavaliers, I mean, really a bunch of ways that this could go. Because as I said, looking at the games that are left for teams, there's still two games remaining for Boston, whereas there's a game left for Indiana and Brooklyn. Now, Brooklyn is not a part of the Cavs equation, but technically Brooklyn has not been eliminated just yet because they're only a half a game behind Indiana, they also have two games remaining. So there can still be some shuffling. Indiana or Brooklyn could end up with that eighth spot. Only Indiana or Boston can end up with the seventh spot. So it's going to be one of those two teams that the Cavs end up with in the first round of the playoffs. It's either going to be the Boston Celtics or the Indiana Pacers. And and we'll see how that, of course, uh, a big one here tonight that's going to determine a lot of that, a couple of them. You've got Boston. They are taking on Toronto, and Toronto's not laying down. Toronto is a half a game back from Chicago for three and four and they're looking to flip-flop and jump over Chicago here and get themselves in that third spot for seating purposes so that's no no easy one right there for Boston I mean that's not the Cavs resting guys all weekend long that's a team that's probably going to try to beat you so that's a tough challenge for Boston there and Indiana has got Washington so there's going to be uh there's going to be a couple of games there when we come back tomorrow we'll see how things shake out and then we'll know heading into that final game uh, obviously after tomorrow night we'll know for sure who it's going to be but as of now it could be Boston it could be Indiana I don't, I don't think I'm the only one I think anybody would rather play Boston just because they don't they don't match it up man they're the, to me that's a that's that's the that's the typical first round matchup where you have a a, a bit of a light sweat and you get out of there without too much bloodshed and the Indiana Pacers that's a different story I was talking a bit yesterday I mean it's not just the matchups it's the experience levels too and having been through some wars and as we know that's a team that's that's been around and done that they've got the momentum of getting their guy back and Paul George and all that so uh, that's a much tougher out. I still think the Cavs, either way, would advance through the series. As I said, I don't see a team that's winning four out of seven from them. But that's a bloodshed. That's a that's coming out bruised and battered. And you'd much rather have a, a I don't know, though. Part of me says go through it, but then again, why wear yourself out early? We'll know soon enough how that's going to go tonight. We'll see what happens with those games there, and then, of course, everything winds up tomorrow. And it's not just the East either. I mentioned the West. New Orleans and Oklahoma City, they got a one-game deal here going on, man. I mean, as it stands now, New Orleans holds the tiebreaker and they play the Spurs in their final game of the season uh, Oklahoma City they were hey they almost lost Westbrook they were able to not have him suspended from the uh, too many uh, technical fouls here throughout the season but because uh, he got 16 but they did not suspend him and that would have been it because without Westbrook they were done but they took care of business they knocked off Portland that was must win and it was a huge game too. Westbrook had 36 points, 11 boards, seven assists, and so now they put themselves in position. Uh, not only does Oklahoma City have to beat Minnesota, which is a very, very, very doable task for them, but they need the Spurs to win. If the Spurs beat the Pelicans and the Thunder win, Thunder get the eighth spot, and they'll get a first round. Man, what a first round matchup that would be, even without Kevin Durant. What a first round matchup that is, man! With uh, with Oklahoma City, if they're able to grab that there, and the Golden State Warriors. But uh, no matter what happens, if uh, New Orleans wins, they're in. If they win, they control their own destiny. Meanwhile, Oklahoma City needs help. So if New Orleans wins, they're in. If Oklahoma City loses, New Orleans is in. Either one, and the opposite scenario: Thunder has to win, and they need the Spurs to beat the. Uh, to beat the Pelicans. I'll tell you what, uh, who know? you know, Pop, he loves to rest guys, and, and we'll see how that plays itself out too, but that'll be interesting too because that's a totally different first-round dynamic for either one of those teams, whether the Warriors are looking at the Pelicans, and and then, of course, you've got uh, Davis. You've got a lot of challenges there, and hey, uh, uh, 
you know, the other way around, as I said, what could be the most exciting first round matchup in the playoffs with the Thunder, even shorthanded, even without uh, without KD. That could be a heck of a matchup with the Warriors. So uh, you got to love it if you're the NBA or if you're an NBA fan to have it all coming down like that. But that's a, a couple of good ones there. And you see the difference is I can get much more. And hey, last year. I was into, hey, the Cavs can get into the playoffs with a sub-500 record because, as we see in the East, that's about to happen several ways through. But I can get way more into it in the West because they're both teams are a good seven games above 500. I mean, there is no, no – I don't want to say backing in because it's not backing in because it's there's eight spots, so whatever. But, I mean, as it stands, you could, could – end up with three sub 500 teams. It depends on Milwaukee. If Milwaukee uh, wins, then they're about, if they lose, they'll finish 500 and you could end up with two sub 500 teams in the playoffs in the Eastern conference. But uh, again, last year I was all for it on the, uh, on the uh, aspect that it helped the Cavaliers. So I'm not going to change my opinion now, but it's way easier to get into that dog fight in the West because both of those teams deserving to go in. And I mean, really Oklahoma city, you can't take anything away from the Pelicans, but for Oklahoma city to even be in that spot, lost Westbrook for how long lost Durant thought they were getting Durant back. Couldn't get Durant back. And then, you know, to still be there. Hey, and they shook up their season a bit. And they trade with the Cavs. They got Dion Waiters. Uh, they moved things around. Jackson, a lot of things there, man. And here they are with a chance. Although, you never like it when you don't control your own destiny. You know, because even if you win, you can be done. So, tomorrow's going to be a lot of fun around the NBA. Well, for some teams, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot of fun in Cleveland because they're giving away a million dollars, by the way, if you're heading down there in cash and prizes. They're giving away a new car. They're doing all kinds of stuff. Fan appreciation night. Win the, win the jerseys off the players' backs and all of that as you celebrate. And you know what? Celebrating the end of the season. Before I go to the break, I hear the music play, and that's the other thing I wanted to see or, or say. I saw this morning... A few articles about Kevin Love. Uh, One of them in the the Cleveland Plain Dealers. Oh, well, Kevin Love's first season without a a, a double-double average for the season since he started in the NBA. Is he disappointed? No, as long as they win. And uh, why? Why do we even try to tell that narrative? That's not what this is about. Everybody's focused on the wrong things. And and that's one of the other things about the whole jersey thing with the Browns. I'm I'm not saying, you know, I'm a Browns fan, too. That's cool. You want to get some new jerseys? Let's see them, and hopefully they don't stink. But the, the Cavaliers are are a day away here from finishing an awesome regular season. Last year, we win whatever, a handful of games. This year, they're one of the best teams in the NBA getting ready to go on a run. I'm not even preaching about the Indians right now because their season has just started. They're only six games into this thing. they got a long way to go. But, man... That that's where the focus should be, and you guys have got to enjoy it. Stop with this, Kevin. Love this, and and all of it. Who's calling the play? You know what? I don't care. Call the plays on Euclid as the parade is coming down. That's what I want to worry about. Who's calling that play, man? Just so much of the... And I know it's a function of the 24-hour news cycle. It's a function of needing something for clickbait and for people to read your articles or listen to your show or whatever it is. I don't know. Or it's just being plain lazy. I think that's what a lot of it is. Plain lazy. Instead of trying to figure out how to make an Indian's conversation exciting, let's talk about the lowest common denominator. And that's always where I get caught up with sports radio. So if you're subjected today to hours and hours of uniform talk, that is your fault. Your fault. And if you want to hear people complain about the fact that the Indians will never draw because they got swept by the Tigers, that is also your fault. Or you can come on over here and enjoy life and enjoy the sports fix and enjoy the moment because the Cavaliers have given you guys a season to enjoy no matter how it ends. And There's a whole lot more to go, not just this season and how this season ends, but coming up over the next couple of years, man. And it feels good considering where the Cavaliers have been for the uh, last few years, as we know. All right, guys, let's take a break. Let's get this bad boy rolling. Jeff Gorman from Indians101.com. He's going to join me here on the flip side of the break, and we'll talk about those Indians. Indians baseball, a chance to wipe the bad taste out of the fans' mouth from that opening 
home series with the Tigers, the Chicago White Sox. Always a rivalry game coming to town. We'll talk about it next. Jeff Gorman from Indians101.com joining us here on the Sports Fix. Coming up next, Talk and Try. The sports fix. Who's this? The Sultan of Swat. Who? King of Crap. Who? Lost the Swat. Who? The Great Bambino. We may not always know where we're going, but we do hit all the bases. Make sure your home plate for sports talk is the sports fix. The wait is finally over, guys. Baseball season is here at last, and the excitement continues all season long. Here we go again at DraftKings.com, the official daily fantasy partner of Major League Baseball. Daily fantasy means no season-long commitments, just instant cash, instant gratification. Why wait until the end of the season to claim victory when you can win huge cash every day? At DraftKings, it's like a brand new season every time you play. Just select two pitchers and eight position players, stay under your salary cap, and you could be on your way to an enormous payday. Last year, Peter from Colorado won a million bucks at DraftKings in one day just playing fantasy baseball. Hundreds of thousands of fantasy sports fans, just like you and I, have already cashed in at DraftKings. Now it's your turn, baby. Hurry to DraftKings.com now and enter promo code SPREAKER to play for free. You could win part of the $300 million. Yes, I said $300 million in prizes being awarded this baseball season. Use promo code SPREAKER for free entry now at DraftKings.com. DraftKings.com. That's DraftKings.com. The Sports Fix is on iHeartRadio. Download the free iHeart app today. Subscribe to the show and get your fix. I'm Little Teapot, short and stout. Here is my handle and here is my spout. No, Dad, like this. When I get all steamed up, then I shout, tip me over and pull me out. (laughs) This is WWE superstar Roman Reigns. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Fantasy sports lovers, you put so much time, hard work, and effort into playing week to week that it quickly stops being a fantasy and And starts starts getting getting real. Real Real time spent making real decisions, creating real victory. I'm the greatest man in the world! And when the smoke clears, you want to show off those victories with a real prize. I mean, a really real prize. Nobody Nobody does does that that like like Fantasy Fantasy Jocks. Jocks. The crew over at Fantasy Jocks have beautiful, high-quality, and heavy-duty championship belts, rings, trophies, and so much more for all your fantasy sports needs. The trophy's 12 feet high, and it is glorious! Football, baseball, hoops, you name it, they have it. Plus, they have awesome draft kits and party supplies to make all your preseason activities the envy of everyone. If your league needs a ring, belt, or trophy, or you want to upgrade what you already have, there's literally only one place to go. If you're going to be a fantasy jock, do it right. It's mine. The most magnificent belt ever created. And it's mine. With America's fantasy sports superstore, fantasyjocks.com. No football? No problem at Harry Buffalo North Olmstead. From their awesome Wing Mondays to every single Cavaliers and Buckeye Hoops games in full HD, the excitement never stops. Every day of the week brings a different set of food and amazing drink specials. Fight fans, Harry Buffalo North Olmstead is the home for every UFC pay-per-view live on the big screens. And let's not forget their mouth-watering trademark, the Bison Burger. Nobody does bison like Harry Buffalo. The perfect combination of healthy and delicious. What are you waiting for? Get to Harry Buffalo, just outside Great Northern Mall today. Harry Buffalo, Harry Buffalo. join the herd. Join the herd. Now back to the sports fix. Welcome back to the Sports Fix. We are live. We are off and running. J-Rock with you guys here. Getting ready to be joined by my man Jeff Gorman from Indians101.com. We're going to talk some tribe here. You guys, 
keep talking with us. Of course, can't get on the phones right now because Jeff's there, but you guys can do it on Facebook and Twitter, facebook.com slash the sports fix. Tweet with us at the sports fix CLE. You can email us the sports fix at AOL.com. Are you fired up to see the tribe? Get out there, get another bite at the apple, shake it off. And that's what you do this early in the season. And bam, there goes the cliches 30 seconds into the conversation. But that's what you do. You shake it off, you dust it off, you get back out there, and your tribe is uh, bruised but not uh, not broken. And there's a lot of time left. Oh, I just did it again. I'm not saying that anymore. I'm going to go to the phone. I'll let Jeff Gorman use the cliches. He can start this conversation by saying, of course, Jerry, there's a whole lot of games left to go in the season. Jeff Gorman from Indians101.com. Jeff, how you doing, buddy? Well, you want to start off with a clip today, so I will say um, neither a borrower nor a lender be. There you go. All right. What's up, my brother? How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. It's baseball season. It's what we've been waiting for for seemingly forever. And, you know, even if things don't go perfectly, you just got to love it because it's just about every day with your favorite sport. You can't beat it. Absolutely. You know what? I'll tell you what. They had uh, uh, actually built in those couple of uh, – off days that they ended up not needing around this series here, which was a little bit odd, but you you know, it makes sense because early season weather, hell, hell, I wasn't sure for a minute on Thursday if they were going to get Friday's game in to start the season. So, uh, because it was a little wet the day before, but everything was beautiful for the, for the weekend, but they built in a couple of days there so that if they needed to, they could use Monday, they could use Thursday, but it looks like uh, they shouldn't need to. Uh, today and tomorrow look like pretty good days, and we get a chance to shake it off and get out there. But before we we look ahead, talk to me a bit. First week of the season in the books. What were your thoughts? First week of the tribe, little bit of little bit of Astros, and then a uh, little bit of Tigers. Well, it's tempting to you know be negative and say, "Oh dear, the sky's falling." Because in a in a microcosm of the whole season, you know this would be really bad because you know almost everything that could go wrong. Did. You know, Corey Kluber pitched well for two, both times he didn't win. You know, we ran into great pitching, great hitting. The the Royals and the Tigers were both perfect, you know, 6-0. I mean, the only thing that could have been worse is if we, and then we lose a couple of players to injury. It's like, really everything went pretty terrible. But you have to realize that it's just a week, and, you know, it's a very long season, and if you had any kind of optimism about this team going in, and a lot of people did, you should still have that same optimism because, you know, it doesn't sound like any of these injuries are going to be career or season ending. So, you know, we'll get these guys back on the stick eventually. So you still have a team that you should feel pretty good about. And the one thing that I've been thinking of as I've been, you know, contemplating this is, you know, well, what if the Indians started 6-0? The first things out of our mouth would be, don't get too excited. Excited. No, we shouldn't get to the <laughs> And that's a great point. That is absolutely a great point. You know, that again, you know, Jerry Sands, man, you know, if, if if only the first weekend of season made, man, he would have quite the career in front of him. So, yeah, you always remember to keep things in perspective. But uh, speaking of that there, man, a couple of teams charging out of the gates there to start the season. I know it's pretty crazy. And, you know, the, uh, the Tigers getting very good pitching out of uh, Price, and you know the Royals pretty much keeping their momentum going. But if you like you said, if you look at the long term picture, I really don't see either of these teams, especially the Royals, keeping things up over over an entire season. I just don't think the Royals have the horses, and although the Tigers definitely have the hitting, I mean we saw that, and this is one of those situations where you know people are like, oh gee, you know. T.J. House just got his brains beat in, and so did Zach McAllister. Well, he was going up against the Tigers. That's one of the best offenses in baseball, and, you know, that's, that's their strength. So you have to hope that the pitching is eventually going to catch up to them since they've lost so much pitching from last year. And, you and eventually know it will. Bring it back, that'll bring them a little bit back down to earth. And, you know, and, you know, Kluber, you know Kluber and Carrasco, they're eventually going to be the strong pitching that other teams run into. They're going to go out there and throw a three-hitter or a four-hitter, and the other team's going to be just knocked back and hit like, whoa, we just ran into Corey Kluber. So that's going to happen. So that's eventually going to happen. So, again, things didn't – I mean, it would have been worse if we started off, you know, 0-6, and 6, but the fact that we're, you know, 2-4 and 4 in the face of all this adversity, I think things are ultimately going to be okay, especially if they can, you know, win one or both of them against the White Sox. I mean, look, man, six games into this thing, I'm with you on everything you just said. And, you know uh... – 
as well, pitching. That's where I think Detroit comes back to the pack eventually. I mean, we knew, yeah. we know the offense that they have. That's going to be all season long. If you make mistakes to those guys, you're toast. And any team that's got the middle of a lineup that Detroit has can that they're never out of anything. So uh, that was never going to be the issue with them. I still think, like you said, pitching is going to be what catches up to them. It could be a strength for the Indians. Absolutely, we'll have to see. It's going to depend on how four and five settle out and there's a lot of lot of room for that to go and i'm really encouraged by what we saw one two three you mentioned though the two teams detroit by the way how about pittsburgh knocking off detroit there yesterday man right as we went off the air that game was on it was like in the fourth inning so i went ahead and watched the uh the tail end of that while i was doing some stuff i just kind of had it on in the background there and sure enough pittsburgh uh taking care of business but yeah kansas city i saw a headline somewhere the other day i saw a headline um uh, it was just yesterday. It was like, why can't the Royals just be this year's Royals? And it's because everybody all off season kept using the phrase, who's going to be this year's Royals. And you know what? Seven and oh start. It's only one week, but it was a, a heck of a way to say, Hey, why does everybody think we're just going to disappear? Now there's a long, long trail for them to go, but oh, man, I should be ringing a bell for all these cliches, but uh, that was a good start for them to say, hey, who's burying us already? We think our window's just begun to open. Right, and they kind of have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder, too, because they, they're smart. They hear what people are saying. They think not necessarily that what they had was a fluke, but it's one of those seasons where everything comes together perfectly, and it's just you're just riding this magical wave, and you just can't duplicate that over another season. Your starting pitching isn't going to hold up, especially without James Shields. You know, to anchor that rotation, everybody else has to move up. You've got some of their, you know, some of their strong, you know, pieces, their, their, their hitters, you know, some of their, not superstars, but some of their glue guys, you know, moved on to other teams. And, you know, they replaced them with, you know, you know guys like Kendrick Morales and Alex, you know, Rios, who might be okay. But it just seems like overall, you know, the talent level just kind of dropped. And that all, almost always happens when you, win the World Series or go to the World Series, you know, people cash in and, you know, some, you know, some uh, free agents move on and, you know, collect a little bit more money somewhere else. But, um, so on paper, they just seem weaker. And I think they kind of took that to heart. But, hey, we're not done. We're just getting started. So, they've got off to a fast start. But I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, not only if they didn't keep it up, I wouldn't be surprised if they, you know, finished around 500 or so. And I don't mean to, to degrade them or anything. I just don't think that they're that good in the long haul like they were last year. Right, you know what? And here's another thing, going right on your point of if the Indians were the team that had went 6 and 1 or 7 and 0, oh, uh people's overreaction on that end. How about this? Just look around the rest of baseball. As we were talking about teams that have talked about a fast start, how many people and and this is 7 games into the season, so this is all being kept in perspective. But how many people had already dug uh, several shovels of dirt on the Atlanta Braves after they traded off Kimbrell and and they were basically oh, yeah. saying, "Hey, we know what." And I'm just saying they started their season winning six of their first seven games. So there you go. How about this? Indians fans, for people that think, woe is us, the sky is falling. Uh, along with the Indians, I know two of the other trendy picks to be World Series teams, because I had one of them, which is the Pittsburgh Pirates and the Washington Nationals, both teams oh, that yeah. are trendy picks to be perhaps in the World Series at the end of the season. Washington starts out 2 and 5. Pittsburgh's 3 and well they're 3 and 4 now. They were 2 and 4 before yesterday's game, but again, you know, uh just saying. Everybody said, "Boy, look at what the Padres did. They're playing 500 ball through their first 8 games." So, it it's nothing but a, a small microcosm, but there you go. I wonder if the sky is falling all around Washington cuz they only won 2 of their first 7 games. Right, and that's, that's something that we should pretty much be comforted by because I expect the Nationals to be right there at the end. You know, oh, they're, yeah. I think they're going to go very far this year. And, you know, like you said, you see other teams that have a lot of talent. They don't – because all throughout the year, you're going to have a week where you win two and lose four or five, and it's going to happen to everybody. It just, you know, happened to the Indians in the first week. And that, that's the thing about baseball is I wouldn't say it's predictable, but it's kind of predictable. You know, there's – one of the things that makes the NFL so exciting is there's so much volatility from year to year with, you know, free agency and the draft and stuff. But baseball, you know, you don't change too many players, and, you know, you have a pretty decent track record from year to year. So you can pretty much project most of what teams are going to be there and what teams are not. So, you know, it's 
like I said, it's, you're not going to have a situation where 20, 25 guys are going to simply forget how to play baseball. You know, that's one of the things that uh, it's pretty much also the opposite of the NBA, where you have teams that are often dominated by one or two great players. You know, you don't have that in baseball. It's all the talent and the production is so spread out that if you have a, a, a bunch of guys with proven track records, they are more likely than not and more often than not going to come through for you. Yeah, for sure. You know, me really talking about all these records, I don't really look at the records so much for any team. Even I'll tell you what. Now, because I do the show, many days I probably know the Indians record because I've said it several times on the show. But there's times where I may not know the exact record. To You know, I, I'm there within a game or two. Yeah. But early in the season, there's many a time that I may be off by a game or two because I'm not paying attention to that for really any team. Now, one number I do kind of just keep an eye on is the games back column because yes. you, do, you never want to be, no matter what you're playing, you hate to look up at a big hole early on in the season. But even that, it's such a long season that it all, eat, bam, ding, ding, ding. It all evens itself out, though, as it goes along. So that's that, that's that's part of the thing that I do keep an eye on. But I don't even look at records. Indians are otherwise too much early on in the season. Man, I grew up, my dad taught me that lesson so long ago. I've said this before on the show. My, I grew up with the Indians being in first place through June, you know, and you're going, hey, man, this is the year. Why does everybody say that the Indians always stink and they always fade out? And my dad would be like, son, it's only one month and we're only a weekend. My dad would be like, son, it's only May. It's only, we're only six weeks into the season give them until the fourth of july or give them until june or wait until the yankees come to town or whatever and uh i always tell the story i'll never forget the first time i really learned that was a season i may have been 88 i think the the indians were playing well Uh, they were in first place into june and it was like wow really maybe maybe things are coming around and i think the yankees came to town and swept the the indians so bad that they just tailspin it for <laughs> next thing you know two weeks later they're 10 games out of first place and the season was over but uh uh so you know early season means nothing the atlanta braves could easily start off six and one and still lose 90 games before they're done in fact yeah that's a good point and one thing you have to realize is i know a lot of times we get caught up with the tigers because you know they're the measuring stick they're the division champions you know they're one of the odds on favorites to go to the world series and yep. you think well oh, yeah. gee you know how are we matching up against that how are we comparing against them you know, this year, well, of course, last year, the important thing was to not let them beat us all the time. So that was one problem that we solved, where we pretty much played a little bit even, possibly a little better than even, head-to-head. But I think this year, what you have to realize is we don't have to beat Detroit. You know, all we, even if they win another division championship, as long as we win a wild card and get into the playoffs, you know, we can get to where we need to go. We might not even have to go through Detroit, because if we get in there as a wild card somebody else beats Detroit, we could head possibly to the World Series without even crossing their path. So we can't really get too hung up with like, how are we compared to Detroit? Well, if you're, if you're charting out this season as an Indian fan, just be focused on getting to the playoffs. Because if you can get to the playoffs, especially with this starting pitching that we have, you could go a long way whether the Tigers or the Royals are there or not. Yeah, stay within yourself. And we always point to Terry Francona. To me, that's his strong point, is keeping a team focused on the day-to-day, keeping a team loose and and not looking at that big picture stuff, especially so early in the season here. And you know now, hey, and you know what? Talking about early season and and games back, the one thing that I I do look at is this schedule early on, as now you've got coming out of uh, coming out of the Detroit series. You've got Chicago coming up. You've got the Twins. The The entire division continues to uh, to play a lot of each other here, which is good. I like that. Yeah. Man. Start the season in the division all over the place. Now you've got the White Sox. Always a bitter bitter pill there between the two teams when those Chicago fans come with their White Sox jerseys down to Cleveland and, and, uh, and try to take over the ballpark, especially these midweek games. Road teams, hey, it works because not a lot of – not a lot of tickets are sold locally, so it's easy. Those are games that teams in Chicago, teams in Detroit, teams that are a puddle jump away uh, can come 
to Cleveland early in the season and try to uh, give themselves that little home half, uh, you know, faux home field yeah. advantage. But you've got Quintana and Danks, the two lefties, and here you go again, back to back lefties as they've got a stretch of them here to start the season. That's part of the reason that Jerry Sands came up. What about Jerry Sands? I know one game a legend does make, but he's like Paul Bunyan right now. He's got the big blue ox. He he went to town with those two two out two run doubles the other day. Well, he's showing that he's a major leaguer, and you know we he was well, in the show with so the far. Tampa Bay Come Rays. On now. And- now, just keep in mind that and Bruce reminded me yesterday. But it's look at Mark. You know, Mark Reynolds had led the league in home runs one month into the season, and he wasn't on the Indians thirty days later. So it can all unravel very quickly for the the hot uh, the hot April hitter. Just keep that in mind. But anyways, Jerry Sand, so far so good. So far, so good. And you know, he really <laughs> made a strong push to make it onto this roster on opening day. Just fell. Slightly short, simply because, you know, Francona wanted another pitcher. But, you know, as the things go, he pops right back up here and he immediately contributes. So he's keeping it, you know, he's keeping it hot. You know, he's somebody who has proven that he belongs on a major league roster before. And he's somebody that's definitely going to need, like you said, as a, a right-handed hitter going up against these lefties. And plus with, you know, Michael Brantley being uh, banged up and with his, his back still causing problems, which I hope gets resolved pretty soon. You know, there's really a good opening here for guys like David Murphy and Ryan Rayburn and Sands. They're going to get some playing time more than they would normally expect. And this is their, their time to shine. This is why they got, you know, contracts and why they got, you know, a few millions here and there from Murphy and Rayburn's standpoint. And, you know, this is pretty much the time to deliver because, as we've said many times, this is, you know, this is a roster that really needs to be at full strength in order to be effective. And if you have situations like Brantley and like Gomes, unfortunately, you know, these guys who are pegged for backup roles are going to have to step up and step up pretty big in order to fill those shoes. Absolutely. We haven't even talked about Brantley, by the way. You you brought him up, yeah. and that's a great segue into that because here we go as he's now missed four games to start the season with this back injury. And, uh, you know, Dan and I, Wismar, we were talking yesterday, a little surprised after he played and then was taken back out of the lineup there into the weekend. That was a little worrisome, but they haven't put him on the DL yet. So that's got to give you at least belief that the Indians hope this can be uh, can work itself out here. I don't know. Have you heard anything? Do they expect him to play tonight? I haven't heard anything yet whether he's going to try to give it a go or not tonight. Of course, they had the off day yesterday. Yeah, I haven't heard either. And if he, if he sits out a couple more game, games, you might as well put him, you know, retroactively on the DL just to get somebody else up here and, you know, just give him some more time off. Because, again, you don't want to dig yourself too deep of a hole, but really this team has to be thinking, you know, long-term. And, you know, if you've got a little nagging injury, my goodness, take care of it now because we're really going to need everybody full strength, you know, down the stretch. So, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind losing Brantley for a couple weeks here in April if it means that he just gets that back all – together so that he can really be out there every single day in the summer when we need him the most. For sure. I'm with you. I'd much rather sacrifice a few games in April than anything stronger than that later on. So Carlos Carrasco, fresh off of how he started the season, and what a first appearance for him. You and I talked, of course, uh, I believe it was right before he went out there and played. We talked after the uh, opening game of the season, so we had not yet seen uh, the masterpiece that Carlos Carrasco went out there and weaved. Uh, Indian sent me some stats this morning, by the way, heading into this start. Um, the last 10 starts of 2014, we've talked about how good Carlos Carrasco was. He had a 1.3 ERA down that stretch. Starts off right where he left off. 10 Ks, 6 and a third innings in that uh, last appearance. That now sets him up where if you go back to those last 10 starts of last year, 75 innings over his last 11 starts, Carrasco's got 88 strikeouts. It's just uh, unbelievable. And when you put the first four starts together for Kluber, Carrasco, and Bauer, those three have a 1.3 ERA, 37 strikeouts in 25 innings, first time around for them and second time for Kluber, which is a a good showing. It shows what I believe, which is the first three. And I wasn't sure about Bauer, 
But I think one, two, and three is going to be super, super strong for the Indians here. But we get to see Carrasco tonight. How did you like him in the first one? And then now here he goes. He gets a, a shot at the White Sox. By the way, the White Sox, the anti-Indian or uh, Tigers a little bit here. We talked about the success of the uh, of the Tigers here in Cleveland against the Indians and how much they've done. Uh, since 2013, since Terry Francona took over as manager of the Indians at home, the Tribe is 15 and three at home against the White Sox in the last two seasons. So they're the anti-Tigers when it comes to the Indians here in in Cleveland the last couple of seasons. Although that's a flip flop because the few years before that they would come to Cleveland and they were smacking those Manny Acta teams around. But how did you feel about Carrasco and uh, and now him heading into start number two? Well, I felt really good about him, and I think that, uh, you know, even though things have kind of gone wrong here and there, the one real saving grace of this team, like you said, is those first three starters. And if you can get that being, the, of course, they're not going to be perfect every time out, but if you can really count on those three guys to deliver, you know, sooner or later, you know, your hitting's going to be helping you out, your four and five starters are going to be helping you out. So I think that, you know, Carrasco has really off to a good start. I'd love to see him, you know, perform well tonight, and I think that, you know, that, again, that's something that can really, you know, help this team out. And so, um, <laughs> I kind of lost my train of thought there. But, you know, I, I think it's going pretty well. And if you have a situation where uh, teams are going to be running into either Kluber or Carrasco or both just about every single series, if you can keep throwing one of those big roadblocks or maybe two of them in just about every series, like right here, you're going to, uh, the White Sox are going to, it's just a two game series. They're going to run into Carrasco and Bauer. And then the next team that comes through with their, uh, the twins, they're going to have to deal with Kluber. So if you have, you know, you start to demoralize teams and you keep throwing these big time starters against them and they keep running into you. And eventually that's going to grind, that's going to wear teams down as you get down the end of the season. People are going to say, wow, the Indians really have, uh, some really strong starting pitching. And that's why, like I said, that's why people around the league pay so much for it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Pitching being at the premium. And that works out for the Tribe, speaking of that, because we missed the ace of Chicago's rotation. I mean, we saw how Sale started his season. He was, what, uh, eight strikeouts, one run. Uh, he had a great game the other day for the uh, the Twins in, in their uh in there uh, or against the twins, excuse me, the other day, but we miss him coming around through. Still, though, have to deal with those lefties, and then we'll take a look at Trevor Bauer as well. Second time around, I want to see how he follows that up. But interesting, uh, no hit bid for him last week, mixed in with all those walks. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty crazy. It sounds like one of those uh, one of the games I used to pitch when I was a kid. I would throw a no hitter, <laughs> but we'd be all walks and hit batsmen. Although he did a lot better, he had a lot more strikeouts than I used to get. A couple of other notes for tonight's game. It would be, you know, again, it would behoove the Indians if Brantley could play, not only because naturally you want one of your best players on the team, but against Quintana, uh, Brantley, lifetime, 10 for 20 with a home run and three doubles. So he's a 500 hitter off of him, so he's definitely got a, a good eye there. So far on the season, 0 for 3 against lefties for the Indians. They're batting just 216. Uh, the worst two offenders, Jason Kipnis and Michael Bourne, a combined 3 of 23 against lefties. Flip that around, they went 11 of 29 against right handers. So. Uh, there's a couple of other notes to keep in mind here heading into this one. And Carrasco, hey, the White Sox, remember I said they owned the Indians. They owned Carlos Carrasco, too, up until the end of last season. It was the last few starts when he was in that stretch. He had a couple of strong ones against the White Sox. But prior to that, he was 0 for 4 with a 7-plus ERA until those final uh, appearances against them for him last season. So a lot of those things. You know what, though? A lot of it matters. Some of it doesn't. And, and we'll see how it all comes in. By the way, the Indians looking to avoid their first 0-4 start at home since 1987. And I don't even want to hear about cover jinxes and Sports Illustrated because that's the last year <laughs> that they were on the cover. And they started 0-4 at home in 1987 as well. So they're looking to avoid that with a victory against the Sox here tonight. Yeah, so there's really a lot, a lot of historical stuff uh, that you're mentioning there. Hopefully, you know, Carrasco has, you know, turned the corner, not just overall, but on the White Sox, and hopefully he can come out and show the, the dominance that he did last year against them. And, you know, again, cause you, like you said, these, uh, these division games right off the bat, you want to establish as much 
dominance as possible. And so far, it's been, you know, the uh, the Tigers, you know, dominating us and the Twins. And, you know, but these early meetings, they really tend to set the tone. And, again, it's, uh, if, uh, these next couple games, you know, there's just two of them, but they could be kind of important, you know, if the uh, Indians could kind of get ahead of the White Sox and kind of crush them under their heel a little bit, then they could start to focus a little on uh, the Royals and the Tigers. So I'd love to see them uh, at least split it, but if they could win both of them, even though it's very early, that would be definitely a big boost to just get back up to 500 considering all the bad and somewhat goofy things that have happened in this very early season. Absolutely. And, of course, Chicago is going to be a test offensively, too. They're warming up. They started out 0-4, but they've won their last two games. They finished off with victories in that Minnesota series. LaRoche got himself on track, hit home runs in both of those victories. So, you know, it took them a minute to kind of get things going together, but it looks like they're warming up a bit. So it'll be a good test for Carrasco today and then for Trevor Bauer tomorrow. Then the Tribe has a day off on Thursday. Travel day as they head to Minnesota, and they'll start a three-game trip with the Minnesota Twins beginning Friday night. I have uh, no no clue yet who's going to be the pitching matchups, but uh, it should be a lot of fun as they stay within division. Jeff Gorman, my man, good conversation. Hey, something I wanted to, to uh, ask you, just your thoughts. He came in and he had a good long relief appearance. Sean Markham, uh, what are your thoughts? Do you think that he sits in the uh, in the uh, in that long relief position that he's in? Do you like, do you like the uh, potential if the Indians need him? Do you think McCallis and house uh, get another couple of times around through the rotation here. What do, what do you what do you see in there? But did you like Markham's first time out? I did. Yeah, that was very nice to see him come up and perform so well. I think that House has a little bit more of a, of a long leash. I think than McAllister. Although McAllister really did great in the uh, in the preseason. You know, he obviously didn't do very well his first time out, and of course needed in House. But I think the House was going to turn it around, especially if it helps with him being a lefty. But I think if McAllister struggles maybe a couple more times or maybe even one more time, you know, they might just flip the switch and just let Markham be the number five starter, see what he can do. I don't think they're going to let McAllister try too many more times before they put Markham in there because McAllister has shown that even though, you know, he, they're, they've been trying many times to establish McAllister as a starter, he seems to perform really well as out of the bullpen. His ERA is like under three as a reliever. So who knows? Maybe, maybe the uh, baseball wins are trying to tell something. Maybe that's really the best place for him. Maybe it might be eventually time to just let him be in the bullpen. But so they'll probably give him at least one or two more tries before getting uh, Markham in there. Well, they needed to. They needed somebody. If McAllister was going to be a starter, they they didn't really have an effective long man there. That's where Markham fit in, and it worked out well for them. Seeing how bad House got shelled, I'm way more uh, uh, bully on McAllister than House. I'm the opposite of you. I think that McAllister's start was not as bad. It was, hey, look, I like House too. No, no. What I'm talking about is just. Early on here, I, I I didn't think that, that was the worst. I mean, obviously he could have he was in and out of trouble, but he was able to get out of it, and it wasn't it wasn't terrible. Look, look at House was a little bit different. Detroit ate him alive very quickly. Uh, <laughs> boom, you you turn away from the TV, it's three. You turn back, it's three more, and it's six to one. And before you know <laughs> it, you're digging out of a hole. And and again, it's one start. It's one start for both guys, but um, I'm not ready to uh, to pitch the tent on, on getting rid of McAllister just yet. I think he'll settle in, and I thought his appearance wasn't as bad against the Tigers as House, but I like that Markham gives you that, and, and as Dan brought up yesterday, I guess Chen had a good first outing there for the uh, yeah. in his AAA start as well, so you've, de- you've still got a little bit of maneuverability and flexibility, and that, hey, you know what? Uh, just the performance by Markham, hey, the Indians don't have to do anything more than leave him in the bullpen but the fact that he did that that gets those wheels turning in the other guy's mind that hey the indians have options here and as long as you have options the players know you have options and that motivates them as well so uh, but i'm not as down on McAllister as some people were coming out of that house that worried me a bit these you know detroit's different too like you said they're a team that even if you're a decent pitcher they'll they could still eat you alive so you know you can't judge anything based off what the Detroit Tigers do to a pitcher. 
Right. And so, in fact, it'd be really nice <laughs> to see them take on the Twins this week. I'm I'm not saying they're going to completely roll no, up the Twins, although like, everybody yeah. else seems to be doing so. But it would Better be nice to see House and McAllister get some some uh, some time out there against the Twins and maybe show a little better what they can do against you know some people who aren't exactly you know top of the line hitters and maybe sort of get their rhythm a little bit, maybe even build up their confidence a little bit. No, absolutely. I'm with you here, and and uh, and I'm I'm just having some fun with my man Jeff Gorman from Indians101.com tribe. Hey, I know you. You know, if you listen to some people, this guy has not only falling; it's already fallen, and the season's over. But I swear it's not really. <laughs> We're going to be talking about this a lot. So uh, if you listen to this show, you might as well get that out of your head real quick. But then again, if you listen to us, you're not one of those guys anyway. Jeff, my man, should be a fun week. couple of White Sox games. You and I will circle back at the end of the week. Talk a little Browns here, obviously, tonight. They've got their big fashion show going on. Everybody's going to spin around on the dais and show themselves whatever, man. But we can talk about whatever goes on with them here this week and uh, do a little football conversation on Friday. Sounds good, man. You have a good week, and I'll talk to you then. Absolutely. Jeff Gorman, my man from Indians101.com. Make sure you check him out. Make sure you subscribe to Indians101.com. Always uh, doing some good stuff over there. And here on the show, Talking Tribe every Tuesday. And then, of course, talking some Browns on Fridays. We're going to take a break and get you the news as we head into the top of the hour. Hour two coming up of the Sports Fix. We've got Dr. Football. Bill Check is getting ready to tag in, joining us here next on the conversation. We'll talk Browns. We'll talk Steelers a little bit here. They lost a couple of guys this week. We'll talk some draft as well. As Dr. Football is in the house, the doctor making a house call. Bill Chekis rejoins us after being gone for a few weeks. He's back here next after the news. Doug Plagans, voice of the Lake Erie Monsters, joins us. Three-game playoff rush coming for the Monsters this weekend as well. That's all coming up in Hour 2 of the Sports Fix next after the news. Indian fever. It starts from the very first inning. Indian fever. Each game is a brand new beginning. It's the hits, the homers, the double plays. It's how you feel when we win. So catch Indian fever. Be a believer with the Cleveland Indians. The Sports Fix, your choice for intelligent talk. I'm expecting a very important delivery at the house, so could you please call me if it arrives? I'll give you my cell number. 401-555-1125. Oh. 404-0. No, no, I was just repeating the four. One, four. One, four. Yeah, intelligent talk. Okay, one, one, two, five. One, one, two, five. One, five, five. I'm not giving you quantities of the numbers. I'm giving you the numbers. One, one, two, five. Those are the last four numbers. Oh, I see. One, one, two, five. Yes. All right. Now read the number back to me. Let me get my pen. The Sports Fix will be right back. I'm Tyler Zeller, and you're listening to The Sports Fix. Today on Save on Taxes, we ask 100 people what costs less than filing your taxes with IRS Free File. A car seat. Oh, a pair of shoes. The correct answer is... Nothing! When you use FreeFile, you get brand name software, tax prep, e-filing, and help with the new healthcare provisions, all for free. So, did we win anything? Everybody wins! FreeFile.irs.gov. It's fast, it's safe, it's free. Business owners and professionals, do you want to take your business, your product, your team, your event to the next level? You want to advertise right here with the Sports Fix. Our listeners are among the most loyal listeners, terrestrial or internet. The Sports Fix universe is not only the radio show, but tens of thousands of fans on Facebook and Twitter. Email me, Jerry Myers, the Sports Fix at AOL.com. That's the Sports Fix at AOL.com. And let me help you swing for the fences and hit it out of the park right here on the Sports Fix. Whether it's an oil change or a new set of tires, Quick Lane at Valley Ford Truck has you covered for your car care needs. They're your neighborhood quick service experts. They also offer a low price tire guarantee. Choose from 13 brands, and if you find the same tires at a lower price within 30 days, Quick Lane at Valley Ford will refund the difference. 5715 Canal Road, right under the 480 Bridge in Valley View. Come see why life is better in the Quick Lane. Quicklane.com slash Valley Ford Truck. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Harry Buffalo. Harry Buffalo, join the herd. News break. 
Good morning, I'm Bob Picozzi. 14 teams are in, 11 teams are out, and five teams are still hoping. But Brooklyn is no longer in the driver's seat for the final playoff spot in the NBA's East. A 27-point loss last night at home to Chicago leaves coach Lionel Holland's Nets a half game behind Indiana. We got to make shots. We got to make layups. We got to defend with second and third for third efforts. It was a disappointing loss. Uh, but the way I look at it is that, you know, we have one more game left, and we have to win it. And that game will be tomorrow at home against Orlando, but the Nets would also need the Pacers to lose, either tonight to Washington or tomorrow to Memphis. Kansas junior forward Perry Ellis has decided to return to the Jayhawks for his senior year instead of entering the NBA draft. Coach Mike McCoy and other members of the Chargers organization will work out Oregon quarterback Marcus Mariota today. This is according to ESPN and multiple reports. The Yankees could be without left fielder Brett Gardner for tonight's game in Baltimore. He left last night's win over the Orioles when he was hit by a pitch in the left wrist. X-rays were negative. Prize money the French Open is increasing. The men's and women's champs will each take home $1.9 million. Sports Center is brought to you by True Car. If you're in the market for a new car and want to have an amazing new experience buying it, you need to check out True Car. Save time, save money, and never overpay. Download the True Car app today. You're listening to The Sports Fix. Welcome back to the Sports Fix Live Hour 2, rolling on. J-Rock with you guys here and getting ready to be joined. It's been a few weeks. My man, Dr. Football, Bill Check is back in the house, feeling good joining us here. We're going to talk some NFL, NFL draft, of course, all the things going on around the Browns and all that. Doug Plagans, voice of your Lake Erie Monsters, is going to join us here in just a little bit, second half of the hour. We're going to talk some Monsters hockey playoff push with him as well as we wind down hour two but we're just getting rolling welcome back in you guys keep the conversation going i'm j-rock tell me who you are on facebook on twitter facebook.com slash the sports fix tweet with us at the sports fix c-l-e email us the sports fix at aol.com facebook.com slash the sports fix tweet with us at the sports fix c-l-e email us the sports fix at AOL.com. I'm going to the phones. Let's get the doctor in the house. Dr. Football, Bill, check us on the phones, on the hotline, and on the sports fix. Bill, how you doing, my man? Well, Jerry, it's good to be back, first of all. And uh, I'm the one that needed the doctor, needed the doctor. And um, I'm very fortunate to be here because, once again, you're truly cheated death. Hey, man, I'm glad to hear it. Very, very glad to hear it. Glad you're feeling better. Glad you're back in the house with us, my man. Absolutely. Me too, me too. It's good to be back. I, I miss I miss my regular routine. There you go. Well, we're back into it, all right. And uh, let's do some stuff. You know what? Actually, a lot of couple of different things I wanted to get into. We'll talk. I know draft is your usual routine every year around this time. We're gonna talk a little draft here in a little bit, but uh, let's talk some Browns. And uh, by the way, I, I, and I don't know if any of you guys saw it. I had some people send me some. Uh, and, and again, I don't get a chance every day. I, you know, uh, Triv is one of the big hosts here in town. Somebody sent me an article from him yesterday uh, where, I don't know, Manziel was out of, of rehab for a day, and apparently somebody was was pawning off some photos of him partying in a bar, but there was some confusion on whether they were taken now or taken earlier or whatever. I don't know, but I found it amazing, although I shouldn't at this point, that Within 24 hours or whatever, within such a short period of time of Johnny Manziel being out from a facility where his every move was being monitored, how quickly uh, another story came out, man. I mean, that's a regardless what you think of the kid, man, that's a tough life to live, man. But uh, um, at any way, at any rate, regardless of whatever it is or not, that was just I found that interesting. I'm like, man. 
bro, man, we can't go 24 hours without some crazy story starting to break there. And it just continues to show the focus why I think that uh, where there's smoke, there's fire when it comes to the Browns here and the NFL draft and Marcus Mariota. I just, I continue for two years. I've heard inside how much Ray Farmer loves that kid in the future. When he comes out, that's who Ray Farmer has really got a, a man crush on, so to say. And here we are now the kid's coming out. Browns have no confidence in anybody, anybody here at quarterback. And uh, I continue to think, man, they uh, – and, and looking at the draft, he may end up dropping to them by the way this thing goes, although that would take a wild set of circumstances. But uh, uh, wh- what do you think? Let's let's start there with the Browns, with Johnny Manziel. And by the way, have you seen that? Have you seen that picture that's going around and, and people are trying to uh, figure out if it was taken post-rehab or not? I have not, Jerry, but uh, I will tell you this. Um, you know, there are some unscrupulous people out there that will do anything to make a buck. Oh, God, yes. Absolutely. You know, <laughs> and again, that's where. And if, they could, if they could circulate some pictures of, of, of uh, Johnny Football, uh, whether he's Johnny Football, Johnny McBeal, Johnny, or Johnny Drunk, drunk, you know, Johnny Drinker, um, they're going to do it if it's going to make them uh, some money from TMZ. Well, like, and the thing that, it's, it's well known that TMZ will buy just about anything. Well, of course. I've trust me. I've, I've dealt with TMZ firsthand, actually, so I can I can tell you about how much money they spend on on ridiculously in inane stories. But uh, anyways, here's the thing that got me was that this thing had started to go out a bit and get around before anybody even stopped to question when this picture was taken. There was no time stamping with it, nothing to, to show anything. And I'm just that I've, I often get on a rant about just disingenuous things in the media. And that's one of the things that drives me nuts. Listen, I'm as much a, I have no belief in Johnny Manziel as anybody. I will not back down from that at all but i i still i'd rather i'd rather you 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 talk about what he actually did instead of fabricate just in general uh the fact that that's the one thing that bothers me about the the twitter type of news breaking and and it, it is a very good thing in a lot of ways to have twitter breaking news the way it does because it can instantly disseminate a news story to billions of people without even exaggerating and so that's never going to change that's a part of our news culture now but the opposite side is there's millions of those people without journalistic ethics that'll put these things out there not caring it's like the old adage they'll put the story on the front page and the recanting on the back page you know did I, did I tell you? Did I tell you my Twitter story? I don't know. Uh, you have a Twitter story. I don't know, but go for uh, it. Man. I have a Twitter story. Um, a couple of years ago, at the draft when I was still working with some partners, um, uh, certain very well known now um, reporter tweeted something, and and he actually blessed with my colleague for uh, the. Well, let's, let's face it. She works for the Colts. A friend of mine, she's a reporter. Uh, she has a show in Southern California, but she's, she's, she works for the Colts, for their media. Um, and he said something to the effect of, you should tell your owner to stop using Twitter. So she took this gentleman to test. He's a very well-known gentleman who's on TV every Sunday night. And I'll leave it at that. And she told him, remember, 140 characters is not a new story to make. Well, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Check, but check that's, your facts. That's, check well, your facts. Come on. Again, and, like I said, you know, that's what we live in, man. That's It's 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 so quick to put it out. And, and then even – I've even seen that, that people that have reported misfactual information. And, again, I don't know if this is or isn't. It was just something that was sent my way. I, it was literally sent to me last night, this article that, uh, like I said, uh, Trevisano, one of the shows here on the on the big news station in, in town, they were batting this picture around and trying to get down to the legitimacy of whether it was taken uh, recently or not. And I'm like, they're like, hey, what do you think about this? I'm like, I don't have the slightest clue, but why is this thing being batted around the Internet if we have not yet uh, determined if it's a story or not. That's what bothers me. But you know what? People go off and run. And, and again, there's no 
it's a different world as far as the journalism and all of that. And that's why I always tell people to be careful what you hear. Be careful where you hear it from. Uh, just because the website looks fancy and it looks professional, it does not mean anything. There's a lot of people that know how to design websites and, and do a lot of stuff like that. But uh, uh, anyways, uh, Johnny Manziel is out of rehab and he is coming to camp here after the draft with the Browns to be one of the quarterbacks. What do you think, seriously, would you put, looking a couple of weeks out from the draft, at the odds that the Browns stand pat at the quarterback position coming out of the draft with with Manziel, with McCown, with uh, Connor Shaw? Well, this is the thing, okay? Once again, there's only one quarterback in the entire draft, as far as I'm concerned, moving up for him. Okay, that's Winston, and, right? And no, it's, it's not Winston. no Mariota. It's Mariota. Well, a lot of people feel that it's Winston Mariota. is the one you go up for. A lot of people feel that's who you go up for, and Mariota is the the clear number two. You don't feel that way. No, I feel Mariota's the number one, and Winston's the number two, okay. simply on um, the behavior issues. Okay. Uh, those questions still haven't been answered. Yes, Winston's a very talented guy. He's a very, very good quarterback. I would say that if he behaves himself in the NFL, someday he'll be a great quarterback. But is he another Johnny Manziel? You have to ask yourself that. You look at the trouble he's been in, and I don't want to be rude, vulgar, or disrespectful, but, you know, this is a PG-rated show. But, okay, hey, man, he he's, has, he's, he, yeah. let's be honest. He has trouble keeping his pants. Oh, yeah. We know all the issues that have been around with him. I mean, with Winston, I agree with you. See, physically, man, he is a, he has the ability and the potential to be something special in the NFL. There's no doubt. But he also has the potential, whether you want to use the term Johnny Manziel, whether you want to say Jamarcus Russell, whether you want to pick any of a, of a litany of guys that went early and just turned out not Ryan Leaf. There's a lot of guys, big bodies, big arms, a lot of guys that were going to be that guy that it didn't turn into, you know? And so he could go either way, but I mean, I agree with you. If it wasn't for the character issues, I would definitely, uh, that would be a guy that I would want to try to develop as a quarterback. But when you look at, and we're not just talking character issues, guys, everybody uses that term to describe whether you didn't pay your parking tickets on campus or whether you were accused of rape, you know, and they're not all the same at all. They're not all the same. There's many different kinds of character issues. There's kids that just have trouble not smoking pot, and I'm not trying to minimize that, but they're teenagers, and sometimes they grow out of it, and sometimes they don't, or 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 maybe they're they're influenced by bad people, or maybe they're just bad people. There's all kinds of different character issues, and you've got to determine whether when you pull a player out of his community or out of his circle, can he be a different guy? A lot of times guys do straighten out, but if not, hey, who knows? And he's got so many red flags. He didn't just steal crab legs from the store. I mean, this was a guy that had some major accusations around him, and there's a lot of people that believe, rightfully or not, that he's a guilty man walking around free because of the culture around the Florida State program with the police department and all of that stuff. So that is more than just a character issue, and that is where I would have a hard time pulling the trigger. But if I'm a football guy, if I'm a general manager, that's my job at the same time, so I can understand why a guy is thinking, man, I'm going to take a chance on a guy, because if you're right... You may have the next great quarterback, but if you're wrong, then you've you've just busted another first round pick. Well, Charlie Castle seems to think that uh, the Browns are going to move up to five with the Redskins in a trade, and they're going to get Mariota. And I think they're going I after him figure, too. I like Charlie, but he also has Jameis Winston at number one, as does Zerline and Brian Baldinger, and a bunch a of, of other people do. on F- on yeah. NFL.com. And they all seem to be in accord that Leonard Williams is number two. I'm not so sure. I see Dante Fowler Jr. moving up the boards, the very talented outside linebacker from Florida. He looks really, really good. Okay, Kevin White is probably from West Virginia, is probably the top wide receiver in the draft. You know, you're talking once again, it's a very, very thin class at the skill positions. And there's been a trend over the past few years 
that only the teams that absolutely need a skilled position player are drafting them because they just cost too much money. They would rather pay a lineman who they could develop over three, four, five years, and they have a better chance of keeping him healthy than they do a receiver or a quarterback. And I, I'm with you on that. And I'm part of my gut when we started this conversation is I keep going back to I think the Browns are going after Mariota. I could see your scenario. I've heard a lot of people pitch that out there because obviously you've got to get up high enough to take the Eagles out of the equation there and anybody else that may be interested. So, yeah, that's something that I definitely think could be in play. And I don't know, again, that I'm all about it. I just think that the Browns need talent. They need. They cannot afford to package up too much of this and to, to move up to one spot. And I know everybody's going to counter back and say, but if he's your guy, but if he's your guy, I agree. If he's the guy, all right, man, I, I'm with you. Then a year from now, I'll go, damn, am I glad that the Browns made that trade? But at the same time, man, with 12 and 19, two incredibly talented players are going to be there that are going to deep in your roster, whether you go wide receiver, whether you go uh, with a different, a lot of people seem to think they're going to, really a lot of people think, and I can see it, they're going to go wide receiver and defensive line in the first round if they don't make any moves, and, and I could see that. I could also see in their first three picks, I can see wide receiver, defensive, and offensive line being the two, or the, the three positions they attack in the first and second round of the draft, but that's assuming that they don't go after the quarterback. Your gut's telling you they're going up, huh? Uh, you know, at this point, at this point, I can't see why they wouldn't. But if they go up, they don't have to go up to get a quarterback if they don't want to. Now they're probably thinking they need a quarterback at this point because they think Johnny's on, you know, Johnny's on the loop de loo wagon, you know, and uh, they don't know if they've got. The quarterback they saw in college, or if they got the guy they saw last year, and they, you know, when he played, and they're really concerned about that. When you look at the top fifty players now, Dan Jeremiah has been a very respect, respected scout for quite a while, and um, you know, I spoke to him at the last draft I attended in thirteen, and uh, we had like about a twenty-five minute conversation, and when we were projecting out to fourteen and fifteen. You want to talk about some guys, you know, he thinks Leonard Williams is the top guy in the draft. And I don't necessarily agree with that 100%. I think Kevin White is probably the better overall pick, uh, even with Winston in the top five, okay? And he's got Mariota at seven, okay? I don't think that's too far off. I think he belongs a little further up. You've got Devontae Parker as a good wide receiver coming out of Louisville. Um you know, you've just got so many guys. You've got Todd Gurley, who's a pass catching running back out of Georgia. Uh, a lot of teams, you know, they would say, well, we really want a wide receiver, but would you not take Todd Gurley at 12 if he was there? No, of course you wouldn't. You wouldn't pass him up. Same thing, you know, if, uh, you know, same thing if Parker, if Parker were there at seven. I got to tell you, Mariota Gurley... was gone already. With Gurley, I hear you. A lot of people have made the argument that if he's there at 19 or whatever for the Browns, and, you know, I don't care even if you've got running backs. I, I like he's Gurley. He's not going to be there at 19. But I have I have concerns about him holding up. But other than that, I'm with you. I would not argue. This is not taking Trent Richardson in the in the top five and trading up a, a pick to go get him, in my opinion. That would be a totally a different situation. I'm with you. I would not have a problem with that at all. Let me flip back to the quarterbacks and go back to the top of the draft because here's one of the things. Even if you want to say the Browns trade up to five or or whatever to get in front of the Jets and get in front of these other teams, the Eagles, whoever else uh, needs a quarterback or, or whatever, uh, doesn't, doesn't Tennessee and Tampa Bay both Aren't they likely to both just take those guys off the board one and two? Because I sure, everybody... and, and so are the Raiders if they don't trade. If they don't trade well, out, well, the Raiders. The Raiders I think the Raiders are settled. I think I think Derek Carr and and uh, and uh, obviously Blake Bortles three and four probably aren't looking for quarterbacks, but one and two both are. I'm not saying for sure that Tennessee would take Mariota if Tampa Bay takes uh, Jameis Winston, but. 
especially if it goes the other way, which I don't think it will. But if it goes the other way, Winston's coming off number two for sure, but I don't think it goes that way. But either way, both of those teams, if you think Tennessee is coming in with Zach Mettenberger and they're happy, that's like the Browns saying we're happy with McClown. You know what I mean? Like, no offense, but they're not. So uh, you can say you're happy with it because that's the guy that we've got. For now, we have to be happy with him. But uh, I could totally see those quarterbacks come. I don't think they necessarily do but for people that think it's just as easy as the browns trading up to five or trading up to six or whatever uh i don't necessarily and that's why there's so many variables that i don't even go there man i pick who's on the board when it comes up at number 12 i take if it's one of if you want to take a wide receiver okay i don't know who's there i know white will be off the board for sure cooper will probably be off parker maybe is still on the board when they uh when they draft and that would be one I wouldn't mind the Browns taking. As you said, Gurley, I kinda think he's stuck because you almost would have to, like you said, take him at twelve because I don't know that he lasts till nineteen. I don't know that he goes as early as twelve, but once you get to sixteen, seventeen, I mean I could definitely see a couple of different teams that would jump on him. Houston, uh teams that would jump in there. So I don't know, like you said, that he makes it to you at nineteen. There's an X factor, but uh, that's why I don't go up after the quarterback, man. I gotta get me two football players here in the top twenty. Yeah, you know, I don't disagree with that. You know that would be the, that would be the smart plan, but when you look at when you look at where the draft is laid out, and guys like Danny Shelton, uh, Trey Waynes, okay, Gurley, uh, Randy Gregory, they're going to be gone. They're going to be gone at nineteen. These guys are going to be in the first half of the draft. If Gurley is not drafted, I'll tell you this right now, J Rock, and and let's plan to do a Friday morning, okay, uh, second day of the draft, because I'll tell you right now, Gurley is not picked. In the top 16, he doesn't go until the third round. Wow, there you go. As good as he is, he will drop. If he is not taken in the top, and he is he is on an upswing right now, and, and Baldwin Joe loves him. And, you know, I like Baldwin Joe. I think he's smart, okay? But when you got Winston walking around saying, I'm the best player in the draft, okay, you have... Phil Simms saying the Titans should pass on Mariota at two, but he should fall to anywhere from four to seven. You got if you want to get him, you got to go up to get him. And you know, Farmer is probably saying, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, let's do it." And the coach and the owner are probably more on the same page than the general manager is. The, the coach, the owner is probably saying, "Yeah, go get him." But don't make me spend a lot of money when I'm spending a lot of money on this guy who just got out of rehab. And the coach is saying, I already got one problem quarterback, so don't pick Winston. If you're going to go up for a quarterback, it better be Mariota. It better not be Winston. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, and again, I don't think either of these conversations will end up coming back. I think that the Browns are uh, – are, are, uh better served to take the two picks but we'll see man they they like i said whenever you've been whenever you've been attached to something for a while you know it's hard to imagine a guy not even if ray farmer's like you know what i'm gonna go with what i got uh i'm gonna go with my draft picks it's still when that guy that you've been watching for a couple of years is there that tempt, you never know what triggers get pulled on draft night and which is coming around soon and, enough by and, the way and the other thing is if farmer is a smart gm he should say, I'd rather get a junior or a senior than a sophomore. If he's a smart GM, okay, I don't think he's a I don't think he's a dumb guy. But is he a smart GM or is he a GM that's gonna pull the trigger on another set of problems? That's the question. Absolutely. That's the thing. Is sometimes you try and that's what I worry about. I think that's what the Browns have done for the last however many years is they've screwed up in the draft or, or whatnot with their player development and evaluation. And it's like you try to fix the previous mistake. And then 
You know what I mean? Like, uh, and they, you know, there was there was another time too in the late eighties where it appeared like the the Browns tried to do that in their drafting, and it's why they they lost the momentum of that great run because they everybody wanted to have hands in the draft, Modell and Schottenheimer. Everybody wanted to have a little piece of the draft, and so they would screw up in one way one year, and then they would overcorrect. I guess that's the term I'm looking for. You overcorrect the other way, and you go, well, we have to hate that term when it comes to the draft. Well, we've messed up on the quarterback for three years in a row. We have to get it right this year, you know, or, and I just use quarterback as an example. It could be any position, but like last year, the Browns did not draft a wide receiver. Now everybody says they have to take a wide receiver in the first round, and I do agree. I want to get an impact wide receiver in this draft. It doesn't mean it has to be with the 12th pick. It could be somebody else, but you you run the risk. That's what it is when you're drafting for uh, want and when you're instead of drafting for you know drafting the best player available, you're taking guys because you have to fill that position. You need a quarterback, even though there are six wide receivers better. You go take that quarterback because you need to, or you messed up last year and you're overcorrecting this year. And that's what I don't want the Browns to do anymore. Well, I'll tell you this: a better move if you're going to trade up. A better move would be to swap twelve with eight and some picks later, and make sure you get Devontae Parker. Because he is the overall second-best wide receiver in the draft. And I think so. To tell you the yes. truth, I think he's very talented. I think he played against comparable competition in the ACC. Um, people were saying that um, you know White playing in the Big 12 played against better competition. I disagree with that. Um, I think the ACC has some tough defensive teams. Uh, that that's where your so is. And J Rock, you're pulling out the late eighties. What were you, six when that happened? No, but I was in my I was in my youth. I mean, uh, it doesn't matter. Totally I look right, back so. now, I know the Browns history. I know what happened. I was living I know, through it I then. Know. I'm so kidding, I'm so kidding. I thought Clifford Charlton really was a mad dog in a meat market or Mike Junkin. I thought he really was a mad dog in a meat market. Take the compliment, brother. Take the compliment. No, I'm with you, bro. I'm with you, my man. Doctor Football J Rock, we're talking about the Browns having some fun here. And uh, you know what? I'm with you on those wide receivers too. Me personally, I like the other two, uh, I like the other two most. I like uh, I like Cooper the least of the three. I like Parker and I like White, and then I like Cooper if I'm judging them. So uh, I, I hope that they do. I would like them to come away with Parker. Something in my gut says that Parker is the one after the draft that comes out with uh, with uh, all the uh, oh yeah that was the guy everybody you know. But uh, we'll see. All the focus is on Cooper first. But I think Parker, man, I'm with you. If there was a if I was going to do that, but then again, even there, I think that. Uh, I think that there's enough talent there that I wouldn't even package. Unless you could get a good, you know, I'm with you. They've got some compensation picks. They've got 10 picks plus a few compensation picks. Maybe you could package a sandwich a few of those lower ones in there to do that. But I wouldn't go too crazy because I'd really like to make sure that I come out of this draft with, you know, a deep crop of young guys, you know, because that's part of what they need is depth across the positions, you know. You don't want to come out of this draft with five No, you're very, you're right, you're right right about that jerry you, you know you're definitely right about that jay rock but uh 12 for eight with some extra picks is a much more doable deal yep. than 19 and 12 to move up to five. Oh, i agree okay. oh i absolutely agree for sure i'm with you on that man i am definitely with you on that uh we got a lot more to talk about you know next week we got about two weeks of draft conversations here we can keep this going look at the other side of the ball next week and uh of course, oh, hey, by next week, we'll know what color the new Browns uniforms are, too. Woohoo! yeah, all right. But, uh, anyways. I need, hey, look, I, need to get, uh, I need to get a child uh, large for uh, Sergeant Gator. Okay, no, he needs to rock a new jersey every year. Uh, two years ago, um, <laughs> it was the uh, world champion uh, Arizona, AFL Arizona Rattlers jersey. Um Last year, it was a uh, it was a um, throwback seventy fifth anniversary NFL jersey that I managed to find uh, with Phil Simms number on it in child size for for the young boy, the young dog boy, and uh, he needs a new jersey this year. Oh, there he's got you go. his Georgia he's jerseys. He's got his he's got his Columbia jersey. He's got his Fordham jersey. He's got his 
Uh, he's got his Butler jersey. He's got his Fresno State jersey. Got to get his dog pound jersey then, obviously. And, there you and go. it's all good, man. There you go. Dr. Football, my man. Great conversation. Glad to have you back in the fold. Hey, before we go, I wanted to bring up something. We talked a lot about the draft, talked about the Browns, and the draft is all about filling holes, depth, uh, futures. It's all about the future. Uh, well, the Steelers are really going to have to change the focus of, of some of their drafting here, man. I just, in the last, you and I haven't talked in a couple of weeks. Uh, we talked a few weeks back when they, with Warlids when he was out, but uh, they've now, in the last seven days, Troy Palomalu gone. Ike Taylor also retiring here. And that's some, not only some some well-playing players, but that's some experience ripped out of your defensive backfield and out of your team. That's a lot of leadership between those three players instantly wiped off your roster. But to lose, that's a double whammy to lose the leadership of Palomalu and Taylor at the same time. Well, I have a great story about that. I'm glad you brought it up, and, and I was I couldn't wait for you to get to it. Uh, in 2012, I interviewed Franco Harris. And I got to see Franco Harris in the first game he ever played, an exhibition game in Yankee Stadium in, um, you know, when he came out. And uh, I was a young boy at the time, and my father said to me, see, that's what a running back is, okay? And he made his mark on the Seals franchise. You know, Troy Palomalu made the same mark. Oh, and yeah. um, when, I spoke to, when I spoke to him after the interview off the air, okay, he said to me, the two most important players on the Steelers team right now are Palomalu and Ike Taylor. It's not the quarterback. It's, it's not the running backs. It's not the offensive line. It's those two guys because they are the veteran leadership of the team. Now, for Frank O'Harris to say that three years ago, that, may, that means a lot. Okay. Oh, now, um, I didn't speak to him, but I spoke to his son this week. His son, you know, he's on my, he's one of my Facebook contacts, and you know, my wife has been posting uh, what's been going on with me on our Facebook feed and on the dog's page. And uh, you know, he got a hold of me and said, Are "You okay? Is there anything I could do?" And I said, "Is there anything my dad, my dad, or my mom or I could do?" And I said, "No, we're all good. I really appreciate it." And uh, but I said, let's talk a little football. And, and uh, you know, he's pretty knowledgeable himself, uh, Franco's son. And he said to me, he said, uh, I remember what my dad said about Palomalu three years ago, and now it's going to come true. There's going to be a huge lack of leadership on the team now. You watch. Oh, yeah, it's going to be a void. You don't just replace that, you know, absolutely. And so that's something to keep an eye on, too, because I don't think they saw perhaps – that whole vacuum coming uh, with so many of them defecting. You know, I mean, you you can maybe anticipate one, but uh, I think that that's kind of a punch to the gut, and that's definitely going to uh, take a step back for the Steelers here. They've just, like I said, they've taken a couple of shots to the gut here. You lost Jason Worlds, and, yeah. and now now you lose Malamalu, and, and, and I haven't, I haven't and, spoken to my friend. I haven't spoken to my friend who's a who was a Steelers scout, is retired now, and but he still does some advisory work for them in the uh, personnel department. I haven't spoken to my good friend, Coach John Weston Haver, in a while. Uh, I want to get a hold and get him on the phone and see what he thinks about this. And um, I will definitely do that uh, during the week, and uh, I'll get back to you what he said next week. For sure. And we'll get back. We'll talk some more draft. We'll talk some defense. We'll look at some tight ends, all kinds of the uh, positions we haven't touched just yet as we march towards the draft. Dr. Football, my man, welcome back to the Sports Fix. Glad to be back, man. And uh, you guys in the chat room, behave yourselves. LG, I got your uh, message. Thank you very much. And uh, the rest of you as well, Bruce and Brian and everybody. Thank you for your kind words and your outpouring of support. Um, you know, dialysis is not the worst thing in the world. I'm a little disappointed that I have to start it in my 50s, not my 60s. But um, I really didn't find out that my kidneys were this bad until about six weeks ago. And it kind of, it's kind of like, you know, when you fall down the stairs, Jerry, you don't just fall down the stairs, you break something on the way down. Yeah. That's what happened. Hey, man, I'm just glad you're feeling better and you're back and you're with us and that's all that matters, man. We'll oh, thousand ahead, percent, bro. man. It's a beautiful thing. And, you know, I could do so much research while I'm on the machine uh, for the three, three and a half hours, uh, three times a week I have to sit on the machine. It's really calming. You know, I can put my headphones on and uh, listen to some news reports or catch some music. 
or uh, with my tablet, just keep myself up to date on what's going on. It actually makes me focus on work. Absolutely, and that's important man. Too. Got to keep your mind on it, man. Dr. Football, welcome back. Glad to have you, and we'll do this again next Tuesday, my friend. All right, my man. I'll see you next week. See you all on the radio. Absolutely. Dr. Football, Bill Chekis, back here on the Sports Fix. He'll be here next Tuesday. Hey, guys, while Bill was talking, breaking news. (laughs) Talk about making my conversation with Jeff Gorman outdated from just 15 minutes ago. Sean Markham, out of the equation, designated for assignment as the Indians make a a little bit of a move here. They have announced the sign. Not only did they bring up Brett Hayes, he's been promoted to a take over the backup catcher position, but they have signed the free agent right-handed pitcher Yoli Shashin from the Colorado Rockies, the free agent, 38-48 and 48 lifetime career record, 3.7 ERA. However, outside of Coors Field, which is where he played his entire career, he owns a 3.2 ERA. He had a couple of really strong seasons. He only started 11 games last year due to problems in the shoulder. Hey, This is the Indians we're talking about, of course. He's currently building up his volume down at Goodyear. He'll join AAA in a couple of weeks. He'll get himself major league ready. And then he should be able to perhaps step in and fill that Gavin Floyd spot for the Indians. We were speculating, Sean Markham, Bruce Chen. Uh, Markham may end up still a part of the Indians organization, but as of now, designated for assignment, and he is on the way out the door. And Yolis Chaching coming in for the Cleveland Indians to perhaps fill that Gavin Floyd spot in the rotation. He was somebody that I know a lot of people had bandied the name about in spring training. He sat out there for a while. Nobody signed him. He was a free agent here. The Indians pull the trigger, make the move, and uh, we'll see how it works out. They have a great track record at making guys like this turn into uh, turn into something halfway decent and make very redeemable signings out of this. Could this be the next one we'll find out and of course looking forward to updating you guys on that right now it's a minor league contract again Shachin 38 and 48 3.7 ERA over six seasons but away from Coors Field where they hit the ball all over the place a 3.2 ERA and a much uh, much better looking stat split so that could work out later on in this season could be a good reinforcement for the tribe we'll talk some more about that coming but that was breaking news Hayes is in Markham designated for assignment as well let's take a break and get Doug Plagans the voice of the Lake Erie Monsters in on the conversation the Monsters are chasing down the playoffs they have three games left their three points out of the final spot thanks to a big weekend in Adirondack. We'll talk to Doug Plagans next about that and wrap up the show. Don't go anywhere. Doug Plagans, Lake Erie Monsters, coming up next here on The Fix. When it comes to Cleveland sports, we go from can't touch this. Two. I can't watch this. So listen to The Fix. It's easier on the eyes. Guys, want to take just a second as we head into this break and remind you about the official business printing source of the Sports Fix, our friends at Signs and Ship. Signs and Ship, I'm telling you, Chris and Pam, they've taken care of me since day one, and they can do the same for you. Whether you're a small business that's already been established and you're looking to grow to that next level and expand your business or perhaps you've got an idea that you just know is going to be a great business and you need to figure out how to brand it and how to promote it and put it out there Signs and Ship is the place for you. If you need a logo, they can create one for you. They have a fantastic graphic designer business cards, signs, banners yard signs, mobile advertising anything you can think of that you need to promote your business, they've got it at Signs and Ship. The best thing about them too is each of their locations, whether it's the home base here in Elyria, Ohio that I work with, or their spots in Virginia, Florida, and Pennsylvania. It's all local sourced. Very important to me because we all understand that small business is the lifeblood of the community. So check them out, signsandship.com, or call Chris and Pam today, 440-323-6060, the home office in Elyria, Ohio. Signs and Ship, quality printing at affordable prices. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Fantasy Jocks. Looking to upgrade your league trophy? Check out FantasyJocks.com for championship belts, rings, trophies, and more. 
Fantasy sports lovers, you put so much time, hard work, and effort into playing week to week that it quickly stops being a fantasy and, and starts, starts getting, getting real. real. Real time spent making real decisions, creating real victory. I'm the greatest man in the world! And when the smoke clears, you want to show off those victories with a real prize. I mean, a really real prize. Yeah. Nobody, Nobody does, does that, that like, like Fantasy, Fantasy Jocks. Jocks. The crew over at Fantasy Jocks have beautiful, high-quality, and heavy-duty championship belts, rings, trophies, and so much more for all your fantasy sports needs. The trophy's 12 feet high, and it is glorious! Football, baseball, hoops, you name it, they have it. Plus, they have awesome draft kits and party supplies to make all your preseason activities the envy of everyone. If your league needs a ring, belt, or trophy, or you want to upgrade what you already have, there's literally only one place to go. If you're going to be a fantasy jock, do it right. It's mine. The most magnificent belt ever created. And it's mine. With America's fantasy sports superstore, fantasyjocks.com. Sports Fix listeners, like us on Facebook today. Facebook.com slash the Sports Fix. Hey, everybody. Listen up. Listen up, guys. Hey, guys. Listen Listen up. up. No one should ever hit a woman. Not their wife, not their girlfriend, not their date. No woman should have to fear violence, especially not from someone they know and trust. But that's the reality for too many women. We have to change it. It's up to each of us, because even one is too many. Violence against women hurts all of us. Growing up, I was ashamed and afraid of my father when he abused my mom. The worst abuse of power is when a man raises his hand to hurt a woman. We all have to take responsibility. So if you see someone threatening a woman, step up, speak out, and get help. Dating violence hurts all of us. So step up and help end it. Because one is too many. One is too many. One is too many. One is too many. End the violence. Because it's wrong. Because one, one is too many. Hey, this is Antoine Jameson, and you listen to the Sports Fix. Feel like a monster. Welcome back to the Sports Fix as we roll on. Are you feeling like a monster, Cleveland and beyond? Because you should be. I know there's all kinds of things. There's playoff pushes going on and well, the Cavs aren't exactly pushing. They just kind of kicked the door in this season. The Monsters, though, it's been up. It's been down. The Lake Erie Monsters showing that heart, showing that fight that Cleveland's known for, baby, no matter what. Fighting their way back. They've put themselves into position. This is just going to be a fun weekend right here. You got the NBA playoffs starting, and the Monsters are fighting for their playoff lives. You can't, well... I mean, I guess if you're going to put your fate out of your own hands, you can't ask for a more exciting run than that. Down three points, you've got three games to play, baby. It begins this weekend, and it happened on the back of a great run in Adirondack. We said it was, forget the cliches, it was legitimately do or die. And now Doug Plagans and I have some stuff to talk about. Doug's about to join me on the hotline. You guys keep the conversation going on Facebook and Twitter, facebook.com slash the sports fix. Tweet with us at the sports fix CLE. Email us the sports fix at AOL.com. I'm going to the phones. Doug Plagans, he's got to be fired up, feeling good for this weekend. Doug Plagans, voice of the monsters. How you doing, my friend? Doing great, doing great. Uh, we got a big final week coming up here, and uh, you know, he's playing meaningful games into the final weekend of the season. So right now, the, the stage is set for uh, for a photo finish in the Western Conference playoff chase. Right, absolutely, and I I hear where you're coming from with the way you describe that because I'm there too. I mean, obviously, you would like not to have other people having control over your fate and all of that, but but to be where you are and to give yourself a shot at this point, that's all you can ask for, and it is going to be an adrenaline rush of 72 hours coming up this weekend. Well, to start it off by telling you about the, the weekend in Glens Falls that just yes. a, a couple of days ago, the Monsters, they came up huge, and you and I talked huge. about it before the game, and uh, you called it the elephant in the room when I pointed it out last week, but you know, the back-to-back games between teams that were going into that weekend, 11th and 12th in the conference, you knew the team that came out on top in that weekend set, those two games, the team that 
came out better than the other was going to have a chance going into this final week. The team that didn't, probably not. And the Monsters won both games. So they did what they had to do to set themselves up here for one last push over the final week of the season. They've got three games to go. And uh, that was kind of the preliminary playoff series right there. You had to take care of Adirondack, and the Monsters did in the best way possible with a pair of regulation victories. So now the Monsters find themselves three points out of the eighth and final playoff spot. Monsters with three games to go, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Thursday and Friday at home, Saturday on the road. Toronto has four games to go. So that's where the Monsters, you know, you see they need a little bit of help. And it really, it's going to be a big final weekend, but it starts tonight. The Toronto Marlies play in Des Moines against the Iowa Wild tonight. And uh, Iowa, I mean, the, the standings don't lie. They're the bottom team in the entire league. Yep. And uh, yep. the Monsters... You know they need they need help from uh, from an Iowa team that gave them some fits this year, and uh, you know if, if Toronto wins this one tonight, then you go into the final weekend down five down five points five points behind the Marlies with uh, each team having three games to play. At that point, the Monsters would need to win their remaining three games, and then you need a little bit of help from the outside. Toronto ends with a three and three as well. They will play uh, Milwaukee on Friday, Chicago on Saturday, and Rockford on Sunday. So. That's wow. uh, what the Toronto Marlies have coming up. The Hamilton Bulldogs are also right in that mix. They're they're the other the team that's right there with the Monsters on the outside looking in. The Monsters play them in back to backs on Friday and Saturday. So uh, you know those two teams are the Monsters and Hamilton both in the mix really until the until the final day because they're playing each other. Yeah, absolutely. I was looking at that as you were going through what what was left on the other side of the schedule. I'm like, just all of these teams. I mean, Toronto's got seven and nine in their final three games. The Monsters have Hamilton, who's gonna just looking at the Monsters and Hamilton alone. Regardless of what happens with the other teams, those are two like last weekend, just like last weekend. Hamilton's looking at it exactly like the Monsters. They're going, hey, we've got. 78 points as well. We've got to win these. I mean, it's just in a very exciting weekend all the way around, but well, you've got all of these and, teams knocking at each other. And you know what's tough? There are a couple things to point out. One, you mentioned the seventh place Chicago Wolves on Toronto's remaining schedule. There's only one seat left at the table. Chicago wrapped up the playoffs. That's true. The weekend. Yeah, so that's they're the, locked up. So yeah. that's, that's the other thing that you know comes into play is not only do you know if you're the Monsters, you're looking at um, you need some help from other teams. But you've also got to hope that you get the, you know, the you get the maximum out of the teams that you're looking for mm-hmm. help from. For example, you know, you, you want you want Milwaukee obviously to still be in the mix here going into the final weekend because they play Toronto on Friday, and you know you've got Chicago who's already wrapped up a spot. They're playing for positioning, so they should be, you know, they should be going with their full lineup, not resting anybody. Rockford on the last day of the season. They'll still probably be playing for the uh, Midwest Division crown. I mean, it's between Rockford yeah. and Grand Rapids for that uh, Midwest Division title, and and you'd think that going into the last day of the season, that alone would prompt them to you know go with their A number one lineup out there instead of the alternative. You always worry about it late in the year with the you know the teams up near the top potentially resting players, things like that. But you know you look at it the way it's stacking up, and I can't I can't really uh, envision too much of that going on. I think the I think the Marlies are going to be going head to head against the. Uh, you know, the optimal lineups of, of some of these other teams. But, uh, you know, as we were talking about, the Monsters going to need some help in the weekend, but it all starts with what they can control, and that's uh, their games against Hamilton. The other thing with these two games against Hamilton, we certainly can't look past Thursday night's home game against Grand Rapids because, no. Uh, no. you know, Grand Rapids <laughs> is one of the top teams. And if you lose that game, your hopes, your playoff aspirations become uh, significantly less. You can't really afford losses right now, but, with the Monsters and Hamilton playing each other in those final two games, there's the old adage, you want to take it one game at a time. But if the two teams split those two games, it probably does both teams in. You know what I'm saying? Right, in a yeah, way, you yeah. almost need, mm-hmm. if, you, if you're one of those teams, you need to sweep the two because a split isn't doing anybody any good right now. Just like last weekend. Just like last weekend. Right. Same thing there, you know? And really, if Toronto or if Toronto wins this next one here before that, then they have to go three for three, right? Monsters have to win all three at that point because otherwise they're five down. Yeah, right. They have to. So there, there are a couple of tiebreaker scenarios that could, or I should say, there are a couple of scenarios that uh, you know could work in the monsters' favor at this point. Obviously, a lot of things need to happen, but uh, you know, if as it stands right now, the 
I mean, it's, it's a little tough to get into without a pen and a paper in front of us to break no, things no, down. No, no, no. Math is uh, tough. But, yeah, but math there, is there tough. There are yes. some mathematical scenarios. There, there's one in which the Monsters and Marlies could tie if the Marlies say they only win one of their next four games, and that win is a shootout win, and then they find one point from someplace <laughs> else, go into, the, go into the end of it tied with the Monsters, and then the Monsters could end up with a tiebreaker. But if the Marlies... Uh, you know, if they're held to three out of their final eight points and that, and they get their one win in regulation or overtime, then they get a tiebreaker over the monsters. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things you can't worry too much about that right now because there's just too many things that have to unfold between now and, uh, and Sunday when the Marlies play their final game. But you've got the, uh, you've got the monsters with three games left. You've got Toronto with four games left. And, you know, in talking to some people about this and about the scenario and, and the, what the monsters, uh, you know, what they've got on in front of them going into the final weekend, um, you know, if they're able to pull this off, I, I still don't think this is so far fetched to call it a miracle. I mean, you're looking for a lot of help, but at the same time, this is, this is, uh, they're, they're right there. And going back to the beginning of our conversation, um, you know, you're, you're going into the final season with an opportunity to make the playoffs and, uh, and there's, you know, that's, not a bad place to be. And, and the Monsters got some key players back from the Colorado Avalanche um, here over the last uh, few days with, um, you know, with Joey Hishon and Freddie Hamilton, Duncan Siemens coming back. So they're going to be bolstered a little bit. Uh, and, you know, they're coming off a couple of wins, so they have some good momentum. They're, they're playing. They've been playing with that desperate mindset for the last, you know, six weeks to two months, really. The Monsters have known just how important every win is. And uh, and that's only going to help them going into the final weekend. They know that they they can't let up at this point. You've got to keep your foot on the gas, and uh, and every every point you, you need every single one at this point. You can't leave anything on the table. Oh, absolutely, man! And you know, here's just three what three in a row, couple of seasons in a row here talking about you know lamenting things earlier. And you know, I've been joking for the last week. We've been the cliche police on ourselves because you know it's early in a baseball season. So after every game, you go, well, it's early in the season. You know, all those cliches. But this is where that cliche that you don't want to let other people control your destiny and you want to you want to control your own fate. This is the backside of that. You say them so much that they sound like just whatever. But this is the backside, and this is a couple of years in a row of us looking back and going, boy, if they had only, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And you can hindsight it all day long, and they still have a chance this weekend. But this is where you look back and just go, those little ones that you let slip away throughout the season, you kick yourself all off season when you fall a point or two short, and you look back and see all the places that you may have let them go. Well, you know, it was a tough one uh, on Thursday night when the Monsters lost 5-1 at home to, to a Rochester team Rochester, that, yeah. uh, that's mathematically eliminated. But that's a, a Ro- And Rochester had the Monsters' number this season. Um, you know, sometimes teams just match up certain ways, and, and Rochester gave the Monsters fits this year. Now, coming off a 5-1 loss at home to Rochester, I think there were a lot of people thinking that one was the, was the one that did it, but that was not the case. And, and for the Monsters to bounce back the way they did against an Adirondack team, you know, over the course of the year, been better than Rochester. That was a team that was still in the playoff mix until the Monsters basically, uh, you know, punched, uh, you know, punched their ticket to the uh, to the golf course. Um, you know, the Monsters knocked. They took care of Adirondack. They did what they had to do. Those were two gigantic games, and each team knew it. I talked to both head coaches before the weekend started. They they both know knew that uh, that's that weekend was do or die for each team, and and the Monsters were the team that came out on top, and they didn't just you know, sneak by. They they went on the road to a pretty hostile building and, and they took care of business. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you point to Rochester. It's those ones that get you. They went zero and three against Rochester. What was it a fourteen to four spread on the season for the goal? Just one of those teams that end up having their number. But yeah, that's one as you point to there. But I was with you when I saw that. I said, well. Uh, that may be that may be too much, but then they came and did what they did over the weekend and put a little bit of life back into it. But yeah, about Rochester, man, that's one where you look back at the season and go, boy, they just had the monsters number this year. Yeah, and it, it happens across all sports for whatever reason. You know, you see certain times where one team just matches up with a team a certain way, or or you know the things that don't show up in the box score. You know, you, the where where one team was in their schedule compared to where another team was in their schedule, the the things that don't show up. But you know, you can't you can't worry too much about that now. You have a big game against no. Grand Rapids on Thursday at home and, 
and uh, that's what's next up for the monsters as they continue this uh, this push. And and as I've said, you you can't leave anything on the table now. And uh, and I think there are uh, you know obviously we've talked about their clinching scenarios. There are elimination scenarios hanging up in the air too. And uh, and you know all that's uh, all that's out there going into this final weekend. And basically, what it comes down to is you you can't lose at this point. You've got three games left, and uh, and uh, the monsters are right there. And they have two left at home. So you guys, whether you're coming out to push them onto the playoffs, whether you haven't made it to a Monsters game all season, or or whether you want to catch one more, I mean, this is it. I mean, the Cavs have their fan appreciation night on Wednesday, and then the final two home games of the regular season for the Monsters on Thursday and Friday, and they hope to perhaps bring some hockey back home to uh, to the queue here next week. But Thursday, 7 p.m., this is the big one. I mean, really, you, you don't look any further if you don't take care of business thursday you might as well chalk it up grand rapids oh, thursday yeah, 7 p.m exactly and well then sorry then, i didn't, didn't mean everything. to hop in but just to just to go off of that what you said about the grand rapids game i mean um that's the one that matters first you know that's the first game yeah. of these three games that's the one you have to take care of and uh, depending on what happens with toronto tonight and going into that game i mean it, it could become a do or die and uh, the monsters have matched up well against them and and, you know, going back to your point about what's going on at the queue on the ice, you're going to have playoff type hockey. The Monsters are playing oh, for their yeah. playoff live. And, yeah. uh, Grand Rapids is, Grand Rapids is trying to win the Midwest Division. So there's, you know, there's a significant, uh, a significant bit on the line for each team going into that game. And, uh, yeah. you know, going into the next one, the Monsters in Hamilton on Friday, that's, uh, that's the final home game of the regular season. And again, you've got two teams that are going to be, going to be playing for their lives in that one. So, um, there's a lot, a lot on the ice to see. Thursday is a thirsty Thursday, uh, last thirsty Thursday of the regular season, and then Friday is uh, our fan salute night. Everybody who comes through the door is going to have a chance to win a jersey right off a player's back. That's what I was going to ask you about because I know they're doing that for uh, for both teams here this week. There you go, jerseys off the players' back, and and it should be a, a fun atmosphere. And boy, uh, if nothing else, just to still be alive, boy, that atmosphere will really be insane down there. But it all starts with Grand Rapids on Thursday, 7 p.m. Puck drop. You can hear Doug with all of the call of the action. Doug, man, here we go, man. We're going to come back next week, and we're either going to be talking about a, a uh, epilogue of the season or a prologue to the playoffs, man. Yep, it's going to be uh, – we're, we're, you know, we talk about it every week, and we always say, you know what, we're going to – we'll have an answer to this. After well, we will. We, after we have these we, this weekend's game. <laughs> well, next week when we have our conversation, most likely on Tuesday, we are uh, we're we're going to know one way or another what's going on here. So, uh, you know, hope everybody gets out of the queue to cheer on the hockey team. They're working hard right now, and they're putting themselves in a position to to win, and they're putting themselves in a position to potentially make the playoffs. And uh, and you know, they're they're uh, teams been working hard all year. So hopefully, uh, everybody gets out there and uh, and gives their support and uh, and roots these guys on Thursday or Friday. It's going to be a lot of fun. I mean, it's a, a sports jam-packed next five or six days. you got a slate of Indians games. Cavs will be starting their playoff run. Monsters here coming down the stretch. A lot of fun and a lot of Stanley Cup right playoff down. start Wednesday, yes. start tomorrow night. Tomorrow, the, yeah. uh, And then the Gladiators have a huge game on Saturday against Philadelphia, and that's a game you can see live nationally on ESPN2. Oh, that's right. That's absolutely right. Of course, they dropped the uh, the the game last week to Arizona, but yeah, that game's nationally televised. So you've got that as well uh, on the slate of things to go, man. This is a good time of year, man. Just had the Masters wrap up a great tournament. I mean, it's a it's a good time if you're a sports fan for sure. Doug Plagans, voice of the Monsters, he's resting his voice up for the next couple of days, and then boom. Three-game stretch here that's going to decide the season. It starts Thursday, man. Doug Plagans, Voice of the Monsters, thank you so much for joining us again, Doug. No problem. And like I said, don't forget to keep a watchful eye on that Toronto-Iowa game. Monsters yes. need some, uh, some help from some others, and that begins tonight. That is tonight, and that'll let you know what they're looking, setting up that game with Grand Rapids. Doug, have a good run this weekend. We'll talk next week and see how it all shook out. Sounds like a plan. Thanks very much for having me. 
Thank you, as always. Doug Plagans, the voice of the Lake Erie Monsters. He's here with us on the Sports Fix every week. Guys, get down there to the queue Thursday and Friday and push them on to the playoffs here. Man, we got Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, straight events at the queue here. You got the Tribe tonight and tomorrow. And uh, tomorrow night, by the way, another one of those double shots with the Indians and the Cavs down there. And hopefully the Monsters can do it. Keep an eye on that game tonight because that it, it, tonight, a Toronto loss at least keeps a little bit of of opening there for flexibility as far as the three games this weekend for the monsters a a law a win there makes them have to go three for three this weekend so we'll see how that goes keep an eye on that we'll talk about it tomorrow man guys we're already at the end of another one another great show thanks to doug plagans thanks to dr football and jeff gorman for joining us tomorrow dan wismar from the cleveland fans gonna be here with us we'll talk about tonight's game carrasco getting ready to take the mound tonight white Sox and indians first pitch on this one 7 10 i know you may have to miss the fashion show but uh, Indians and White Sox, Carrasco, 1-0, 0.00 ERA. After that excellent first appearance, how does he follow it up against Quintana and the White Sox tonight? We'll talk about that tomorrow. We will be looking ahead to the final Cavaliers regular season game. Maybe we'll have a little bit more clear picture on who they may be facing. We'll have those final, man, last game of the NBA regular season tomorrow. Playoff uh playoff edition because we're going to find out who gets the seven and eight in the east and who gets the eight in the west tomorrow as well so all of that to do dan wismar will be here we'll talk about urban meyer and his new contract with the ohio state buckeyes and we'll get into some stuff with dan wismar a lot to do guys and we're already that's it hump day tomorrow then we're rolling downhill towards the weekend hey you know what did you guys hear the story i was going to talk about this earlier and when we were doing the news of the day and it just kind of the show got away from me lawrence phillips do you guys remember lawrence phillips remember he was a big uh, big big star in nebraska when he was playing ball big running back drafted by the uh, st louis Rams. had all kinds of issues had issues in college uh it affected him heading into the nfl he ended up he's doing like 30 plus years in prison he he choked his girlfriend uh he was uh he he drove a car into a group of teenagers uh he's he's definitely one messed up individual well he's now he's been serving as i said over a 30 year prison sentence now he's being uh perhaps set up to be uh to be serving a whole lot more because he's suspected of killing his sale cellmate in prison, him and another inmate are now uh, being accused of killing their cellmate here. And so he may now be facing murder charges on top of the time that he's already doing. Man, we, we talk about all the time. You know what? Hey, 20 years from now, that you they'll probably be talking about guys like, Aaron, hey, remember Aaron Hernandez and blah, blah, blah. Same thing here. I mean, one day these guys are getting, you know, drafted into the NFL and, and everybody. This is where you, hey. You know what? We were mentioning character issues earlier and Mariota, and, or excuse me, Winston and all of that. This is where that's not just a cliche, going back to that word cliche, because coming out of the draft, if you were to hit the 24-hour news cycle on a guy like Lawrence Phillips, he had domestic violence issues in college and he had all kinds of stuff around him. That's a guy with all the red flags and stuff, but somebody somewhere felt that the talent was enough to take a chance and it turned out that he was just bad. He was just rotten to the core. Some people are and some people are not some people are redeemable and some people choose not to be redeemed everybody's redeemable but some people are just beyond uh, the point of caring to do so anyways but you know this was one where the judgment was way off and and then he quickly petered out of the nfl and went on to his criminal life but there's a, there's just another one of those stories that when you've got a guy with issues they can turn out to be a saint but they can turn out to be a sinner. And uh, Lawrence Phillips is, uh, well, he'll never see the light of day again, most likely. Anyways, I uh, just figured I saw that and I said, man, that was another name. Talk about taking you back to your teenage years because that's when he was uh, doing his thing for me. All right, guys, Indians game tonight. We're going to wrap it up. We're back here tomorrow with Dan Wismar. Got a whole lot to get into. Hopefully you guys join us once again and do it. Same bat time, same bat channel, live at noon right here across the Sports Fix Radio Network. We love you, Cleveland. We love you, everybody, beyond and all out there, all around the world. And we'll see you tomorrow right here on The Sports Fix.
so much hate up in this city, bitty city. If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. Put your hands up in the air, everybody say yeah, yeah.